on now. All right. Welcome to the semi-annual Taylor Math 1241 Common Exam Review. And uh, hopefully everybody in here has had a chance to look over and do the spring 2012 exam. And please, don't let this exam be the only exam you guys do. Now, if you're fortunate enough to be in my class, I have posted uh, also spring, I see fall 2011, spring 2011. I've given you guys multiple exams to, to look at. They're also on the uh, math department's website. They have a link to old, old departmental exams because there's a committee in the math department and it, and that makes up this, this particular exam. And when you're, uh, so when you're chosen to be on this committee, you're probably not teaching calculus, in this case Calc 1, this particular semester. And it's the same guys kind of over and over again who get chosen for this particular committee. So you need to go back not just last semester, but a couple of semesters to get a feel for what the exams look like. Because what we're going to do to you guys tomorrow is going to be very similar to what you're seeing right here. The exam comes in three spots. The first section is no calculator, multiple choice. Okay, so for all you TI-89 fans that think you got an ace in the hole, it won't help you out on part number one, because the fact of the matter is, it, and you know what they're going to test you on, majorly on part number one. It's going to be all those derivative rules. Now, they're going to throw some other problems at you as well, don't get me wrong, but they're going to be very simple problems that you can do without a calculator that just basically test your knowledge on this stuff. Multiple choice, no calculator. <laughs> The next section is going to be a multiple choice with a calculator. So those are going to be a little harder problem. And you'll discover that even on most of those particular problems, on, the, on most of those particular problems, you won't need a calculator for it because they're going to be a little more advanced, but the number crunching is going to be a little more detailed. So we're going to allow you to use the calculator on quite a few of those. But honestly, you won't need most of those. Yeah. So. All right, and then the third part, the third part of the exam is free response. And you are allowed to use a calculator on free response. Again, this section is where you want to shine for the math department. Show your work. All details of your work. I mean, and there's going to be some problems that, hey, cool, I can just use my calculator and get the answer and circle that. But if you don't show your work, then you get no credit for it. Even if you got the right answer on the sheet, if you don't show how you got that right answer, you get absolutely no credit for that. And this is a classic departmental rule that we use. We're trying, you've got to show us how you came up with the solution. Show all details of your work. Go over Mount in terms of the details you show for this thing. And how the percentage works is this. It's 60% uh, for the uh, two sections, 30% apiece for the non-calculator multiple choice section, 30% for the uh, calculator multiple choice section, 60% for that, and then 40% for the free response part. Okay, And what happens, to give you guys a little inside information, is this. What happens is on Monday at 9 o'clock in the morning, Liz, uh, we have to go to a departmental meeting for all us faculty of Calc 1 students, and we uh, take all the exams and all the people who are professors this semester grade all 2,000 some odd part uh, threes of the final exam. And then we kind of merge that with the multiple choice parts and stuff. So we actually have what we call the quote unquote departmental grading party when it comes to the Calc 1 and we sit there and we grade all 2,000. And, and what happens is, for example, I'll be assigned number one, maybe Liz will be assigned problem number two, and I have to grade 2,000 problem number ones. So after a while, I get really good and very fast at knowing what I'm looking for in terms of these problems, in terms of how I deviate in terms of, well, you didn't quite get the right answer, but you showed what you were trying to do. So based upon that, well, okay, it's worth this many points. So we do give partial credit. That's why I'm telling you guys, always show your work when it comes to this stuff, because we do give partial credit based upon this particular material and stuff. So, um, all right, so let's get started on this thing. And like I said, I, I, hopefully you're not just coming in here with a blank copy. You actually had a chance to look over this thing so we can check some answers. But I'm going to pretend like it's an all-new test for me, and I'm going to take it like it's an exam. So we have three hours of this exam. All right. So what's going to happen tomorrow 
is this. You will come in here to the exam. You'll go to your classroom. And if you're in my class, it's, it's this classroom. And uh, you're going to have to be here at what time? 7.30 in the morning because you've got a bunch of forms to fill out. And you're going to get, the first thing you're going to get is an op scan sheet, which you're going to fill out last name first, first name last. You're also going to have to fill out your 800 number, your banner ID. You have to bring, by university law, your little ID card. You mu all students must have their ID card coming to a common final exam, and you place it on your desk. You will only need a calculator, I mean, excuse me, you only need a pencil, no calculator for this first part. So all calculators need to be put away underneath your desk and stuff. And right at 8 o'clock, we're going to tell you, to, we're going to pass out the little test booklets and ask you to open your test book because it's a timed event. You have up to the first hour to complete part number one. It's usually about 15 questions, 12, 13, 14, 15. Every semester they change, but you've got 15 questions to complete within an hour. You have to be done with that hour. But once you are done with the no calculator section, you will turn it in to me, and then I will have you part number two and part number three and another bubble sheet, because you have to have a different bubble sheet for the multiple choice, choice part with a calculator, but you're, and you go back to your seat and start working on it, but you're still not allowed to touch your calculator until everybody has finished with part number one. Does that make sense? But then I will make a big announcement, okay, you can use your calculators right at 9 o'clock because everybody else had to turn their papers in. If you're not done with it, don't care. You still have to turn in part one to get your part twos and part threes. And at 9 o'clock, I will promptly say, you now you can use your calculator. You shouldn't just sit there and wait for 9 o'clock to roll around because I'm telling you, you can do a big hunk of part number two and part number three without a calculator. No need to waste time and stuff. But you know not, you're not allowed to use the calculator until 9 o'clock, and not what meaning that... I will give you the official word that you're allowed to pull out your calculator. No one's allowed to touch their calculator until I give you permission to do so. That try to keeps it honest that you know I can't have someone working on part two with a calculator sitting beside someone with a part one with no calculator. We, we don't do that. Everybody has to have part number two in their hand before I can make the announcement for calculators. All right, so right now it is 8 o'clock in the morning. I've just opened my test booklet, and I'm going to start taking this particular uh, exam. I'm not allowed to have a calculator, so my calculator is way over there. So let's take a look at it. And then look at the style of problems they're going to do. Again, this is what you're studying for. Now, all semester long, if you've been in my class, uh, I have been working hard on every test has been a mini common exam. So I've been trying to word it the way you're going to see it here to try to prepare you. So if you've been in my class, and no doubt Liz's is the same way, and I know Desiree's the same way, that your, uh, your, my, our tests have been looking like this all semester long, so you really shouldn't go in this thing with any major surprises how the wording is. So let's take a look at the first one. A ball is thrown into the air. Its height in feet after t seconds is given by this equation. What is the velocity at time equals 2? Again, don't need a calculator for this. This is testing your knowledge. How do I get velocity out of a distance problem? Take derivative. Welcome to Calc 1. Take derivative. Velocity is the derivative of y, which would be equal to... 128 minus 32t. So there's my velocity equation, which is the derivative. What are they asking me to do? Find the velocity at time equals 2. 128 minus 32 times 2. Well, this is 128 minus, okay, remember, no calculator, so you actually have to know some arithmetic. What is 32 times 2? 64. And what is 128 minus 64? 64 itself, and that would obviously be that uh, time is measured in seconds and height is measured in feet, so this is a velocity, feet per second, so the answer is B, and I show bu bubble B on my test. All right, then I go to the next one. The next one is this, let g of x be equal to the square root of x squared minus 2x, and we're supposed to find g prime. So, again, when I take a derivative, first thing I want to do is John's one rule of calculus, which is clean it up first. I don't do square roots. What's a square root? Half a power. Look at this problem. Take your time. You've got three hours. You don't have any place to go. Enjoy this. Sit there and look at this thing and go, okay, what rule am I going to use? Chain rule. Drive the outside. Inside stays the same time. Drive the inside. Drive the outside. The one half pops out front. The inside, x squared minus 2x stays the same raised to the negative one-half, time drew the inside, which is 2x minus 2. There's my derivative. Now, immediately I start looking at the answers, and I notice that, great, they cleaned it up. All right, so I'm going to have to clean it up, too. 
because I don't see any one half powers anywhere floating around with the negative one half powers on this thing. So, but I know this: negative exponents go where? On the bottom. So g prime of x is equal to one over two, and that's a half. So that'll go on the bottom. A half a power is a square root. Square root of x squared minus two x, and that leaves me with the two x minus two on top. And I look for that one. And be careful, because this is where most people will screw this problem up. I don't see this answer. I see something like it right here, but uh, that has a two square root on it. But wait a minute, I got something in common on that numerator. What could I factor out of that numerator? I could take the two out. That'll be two times x minus one over two times the square root of x squared minus two x, and the twos end up canceling, leaving me with the answer x minus one over the square root of x squared minus two x. And that answer is answer, take your time, B. Does that make sense? Again, tricks of the trade. What the difference between students who make A's in my class and students who make B's, and for that more, even some C students in my class, is this. The A students catch their careless errors. The B and mostly C students do not always catch their careless errors. And they rush through problems thinking they actually have a life and got to go someplace. You're a college student. You're a freshman. You don't got no place to go. Enjoy this. Just take your time on this stuff and, and be careful. That's what I'm just trying to take. Take your time and be careful because you can easily see how you could screw this problem up by actually getting the right answer and picking the wrong one on your multiple choice test. You understand what I'm trying to get at. And that's a common careless error that, hey, but there, there's no credit for wrong answers on a multiple choice test. You've got to circle in the right one. All right, see you the next guy. All right, what's this one? f of x is equal to 4x plus 3 times e to the negative 2x. Evaluate f prime of 0. Well, first I have to take the derivative. So if f of x is equal to 4x plus 3 times e to the negative 2x, Pause, hesitate, and ask yourself, what rule do I need to take rid of this thing? What are you going to use? Product rule. Drew the first times the second plus the first times the second. Drew the first. Drew the 4x plus 3 is 4 times the second, e to the negative 2x. Product rule. Plus the first, 4x plus 3, times the derivative of the second. Now, this is e, not just x, but it's e to a function. Anything other than x. This is e to the negative 2x. The derivative of e to a function, by rule, is it's the chain rule version of the e. The derivative of e to a function is e to a function times the derivative of the exponent. So this would be e to the negative 2x times negative 2. Does that make sense? Now, you're right. You can go ahead and clean this thing up. But wait a minute. What are they really ask, asking for me to do in this particular problem? I'm supposed to evaluate f prime of 0. So what am I going to do? I'm just going to go ahead and plug in 0 in this thing. 4 e to the negative 2 times 0 plus 4 times 0 plus 3 times e to the negative 2 times 0 times negative 2. Take your time, but 0 is a nice number to plug in, and negative 2 times 0 is 0. But here's the deal. Without a calculator, you now got to know what's e to the 0? 1. So this goes to 1, and this one will also go to 1. So this is 4 times 1, which is 4, plus... 4 times 0, which is 0, plus 3, which is 3, times 1, times negative 2. So this would be 4, and 3 times 1 times negative 2 is a minus 6. So what is 4 minus 6? Six? Negative 2. Answer is A. Does that make sense? Take your time. Again, didn't need a calculator for any of that stuff. All right. So the next one. Now, this is a no calculator section. And with a problem like limit evaluated x approaches infinity, you should be able to do this problem in your head. And look at it and tell me what the answer is. All right, you guys, look at it. Tell me what the answer is. Negative 2. You got it. But I want to show the work in case this was on, a, uh, on the free response part of the test. Just to show you what we're looking for in terms of showing your work on this one. This will be the limit as x approaches infinity of 3x minus 2x squared divided by x squared plus 4x plus 2. Now, showing your work on this problem, we're trying to use that property that 
when we take the limit as x approaches infinity of one um, x approaches infinity of one over x to a power is one over infinity, which goes to zero. So the trick is you multiply the numerator and the denominator by one over x to the degree of the denominator. What is the degree of the denominator? Two. So this would be equal to the limit as x approaches infinity, and I'm going to distribute. 3x times 1 over x squared is 3 over x, minus 2x squared times 1 over uh, x squared, x squared is canceled, that's minus 2. x squared times 1 over x squared is 1, plus 4x times 1 over x squared, cleans up to be 4 over x. 2 times 1 over x squared is 2 over x squared. And again, that property that when I take the limit as x approaches infinity of a number divided by x to a power, positive power, those suckers always go to what? When the infinities are on the bottom. Zero. And that's how you show that you get negative 2 over 1, which is equal to negative 2. The answer is D. Just showing your work. But you're right. If I'm doing this particular problem on test, I may want to check my answers because, like I said, i got tons of time on this exam. But I could have looked at this problem and told you what the answer is. So this is honestly a 10-second problem to get this answer and move on. <coughs> you know this problem is on the final exam at least once or twice. Yes, sir? I'm sorry? Yeah. No, and that, that's my point. I did that for your benefit to show my work. But this is a multiple choice part of a test. All we're interested on multiple choice part of the test is your ability to circle the correct answer. We're not going to grade your work on this one. So, like I said, if I was inclined to do so, I could have looked at this problem and told you what the answer is. And you should have that ability as well. And you didn't have to show your work. I was just doing this in case it happened to show up on a final exam question. It's a good practice problem because I'm going to do this to all the problems. I'm going to do all the work on it even though maybe I could skip some steps, okay? All right, this problem I was just talking about was you know this was going to be on your final exam. So be prepared for it. Find the equation of a tangent line. At least two or three times they're going to throw this one at you. So you should know exactly what to do when you have to hear the words, find the equation of a tangent line. And this one says find the equation of a tangent line of the graph of f of x equals x squared plus 3x at the point where x is equal to 1. Anytime you hear the words, find the equation of a line, a tangent line or otherwise, what do you have to do? What, what, what formula do you have to use? Point slope. Good, you've been programmed personally by me. Point slope. Y minus Y1 equals M times X minus X1. Well, you've got to have two things to use the point slope formula. You need a point and a slope. They didn't give you anything. They gave you half a point. They gave you X is 1, right? You need a point, and you need to slope with the tangent line. The point, they gave you 1. How do I figure out what the y coordinate of a point is? What do I need to do? Plug it back into the original equation. So the y coordinate would be f of, in this case, 1, which would be equal to 1 squared plus 3 times 1. 1 squared is 1, 3 times 1 is 3. I get a y coordinate of 4. So now I have a point, 1, 4. Now, if you learn anything about calculus 1, learn this. How do I find the slope of a tangent line? Take the derivative. So, here we go. <coughs> f of x was equal to x squared plus 3x. Therefore, f prime of x is equal to 2x plus 3. Now, that is the derivative is a formula for the slope of the tangent line. It's not actually the slope. How do I get the slope? I plug in the x coordinate of the point that I want, which was x equals 1. So f prime of 1 is equal to 2 times 1 plus 3, which is equal to 5. So my slope of my tangent line is equal to 5. Does that make sense? Now I use my point slope form. y minus the y coordinate 4 equals the slope of the tangent line 5 times x minus 1. y minus 4 equals 5x minus 5 when I distribute. And then I'm going to add 4 to both sides, and I get my line y equals... 5x minus 5 plus 4 is minus 1. So this is the equation of my line, which is answer D. Does that make sense? Questions, complaints, comments? All right.
Okay? The next one, and again, no calculators on this stuff, but you'll notice that even the simplest problems, uh, the, the number crunching, I am going to have to do some number crunching, but they're usually very simple numbers, like plugging in 1 into these things or plugging in 0. All right. <clears throat> Let f of x be equal to 8x squared divided by 1 plus x squared. <laughs> Find f prime of x again. Well, again, understand what they're really trying to do with the section number one. They're going to quiz you hard in terms of making sure you know how to apply the more difficult of the style of rules, product rule, chain rule, and quotient rule of all the different forms that you have memorized. Everything from the e's to the logs, natural logs, to the sine, cosine, tangent. Make sure you know those guys to the inverse sine, inverse cosine, cosine inverse, sine inverse, arc cosine, arc sine, arc tangent. You gotta know all the, your rules. This one, f of x is equal to 8x squared over one plus x squared. I wanna take rid of What rule would you use to take rid of this thing? Quotient rule. Quotient rule, draw the top times the bottom minus the top times the bottom all of the bottom squared. This is what we have memorized. So take your time. Draw the top. Derivative of 8x squared is 16x. Draw the top times the bottom, 1 plus x squared, minus the top, 8x squared, times the bottom, 2x, all over the bottom, 1 plus x squared squared. Does that make sense? Does that look like any of my answers? Well, of course not. What did they do to it? Cleaned it up. All right, well, that's what we're going to have to do too then. So f prime of x would be equal to, I would distribute here, 16x times 1 is 16x. x squared times 16x is plus 16x cubed minus 8x squared times 2x. Well, 8 times 2 is 16. x squared times x is x cubed all over 1 plus x squared squared. Cancel this guy, cancel this guy. Looks like I get an answer of 16x divided by 1 plus x squared squared. Okay? Which is answer C. Just to let you know, now if I was really looking at this problem, and sometimes you're going to run across a problem that you can start eliminating answers. That I, I mean, I, I can't figure out what I'm supposed to do. I can't quite remember something, brother. It happens to all of us. But when you look at these things, I know I'm supposed to take derivative. I look at this thing, I know it's got to be the quotient rule, which is, I don't know, something derivative, something times something. I, can remember, I remember it's the bottom squared. Even if, look at it, there's only three of them that have the, the bottom thing squared. You can look at them and at least eliminate a couple of the different answers. Does that make sense? Use your brain, take your time. Treat this test like the SAT. Okay, if you don't know it, you can at least eliminate something or other and then take your best shot at it. So this one, like I said, was, to me, it was a very straightforward kind of problem. All right, and of course, there's even some algebra questions on there. Let's take a look at the next guy. Solve this thing. 3 raised to the x is equal to 5. Remember, no calculator on this thing. But this was from chapter 3, log stuff. Anytime you need to solve, it never says take the rid of anything. This is solve. This is not even a calculus question. But anytime you need to solve where the variable is in the exponent, what do you got to use? Logarithms. So, since I don't see an E in this problem, and, and, I'm also looking at my answers. When I'm making, making up trying to figure out how I'm going to do this problem, keep in the back of your mind on the multiple choice, look at how the answers are written. That'll kind of give you a clue of how to attack the problem. Well, all these, all these guys, I know I've got to use logs because I need to solve for the exponent, but i got tons of logs. I can use log base 3, I can use natural logs, I can use common logs. Which one am I going to use? Well, because there's so multiple logs, you look at your answers. Which log did they use? Log base, which one? 10. It's common log, because there is no base written on those logs. For every answer, except maybe the last one, uh, they are using logarithms, and it's common log. So that's what I would use. I would, I'm not going to use log base 3, and I'm not going to use the natural log on this one. I'm going to use common log, because they did. So, I got 3 to the x equals 5. What I do to one side, I do to the other. I'm going to take the log of both sides. Log of 3x is equal to log to the power. Property number three of uh, logarithms. When you take a log of something to a power where the powers get to go out front, this becomes x times the log of three is equal to the log of five. Log of three is nothing but a number. I'm going to solve for x, I'm going to divide by the log of three. What I do to one side, I do to the other. This cancels, leaving me with x is equal to the log of five 
divided by the log of 3. And therefore, the answer is, uh, make sure you get it right, 5 on top, 3 on bottom. That will be answer A. Does that make sense? Don't lose you anywhere. All right. Here we go next time. Number eight says this. Consider the function f of x equals 2x squared minus 3x minus 2, at which x does a minimum value occur. Remember we talked about this in terms of maximizing and minimizing. This is the last test we just had, chapter 4 stuff here. If they ever ask you the maximum value or minimum value, what do you give them? You give them the y coordinate of your critical point. Does that make sense? When they ask for it occurs at, that's usually a clue they want the x value of the critical point on these word problem-ish type of problems here. So on this one, we got a function here, and they want to know uh, the minimum value occurring. That would be occur at, and then they went out of the way to say x does occur at. So we're trying to figure out the x coordinate of my critical point, which is going to be the minimum value. So the first thing I want to do to maximize and minimize, what do I do? Take derivative and do what with it? Set them equal to zero and solve. Anytime you need to maximize or minimize, you take derivative, set it equal to zero and solve. Derivative of 2x squared minus 3x minus 2 is 4x minus 3. Set it equal to zero and solve. So I get 4x is equal to 3. I divide by 4. I get x is equal to 3 fourths. Again, just to remind you guys, there are two ways to get critical numbers. You take derivative, set it equals 0, and solve, and also where the derivative does not exist. Don't forget those when you're dividing by 0 on the derivative. Remember, that could also be a critical point type thing here. It's where the derivative is equal to 0 and where the derivative does not exist at. But look at this derivative, 4x minus 3. Look at the original function. It was also a polynomial. This thing is defined on all real numbers. This thing is defined on all real numbers. So there are no points where the derivative doesn't exist at. This is a nice linear derivative. Does that make sense? So I've only got x equals 3 fourths. So I'll bet you anything the main minimum value occurs there, but let's just double check it. To prove to you this is a minimum value, I'm going to do my intervals of increase and decrease on this thing and put my critical number, this is my CN here, critical number of 3 fourths on my x-axis. To be a minimum, you have to go down, decrease, hit your point, and then go back up again, increase. So proving it. This is called the first derivative test. I'm going to pick a number less than 3 fourths. Use my brain. I have, I'm going to pick 0 because that's the easiest number to plug in. Less than 3 fourths into my derivative. My derivative was 4x minus 3. So this will be 4 times 0 minus 3, which is equal to negative 3, which means it's negative. That means I am decreasing in that interval. Now pick a number bigger than 3 fourths. I like to use well, 1. Plugging 1 into my problem, my derivative, which will be 4 times 1 minus 3. 4 times 1 is just 4 minus 3, which is 1. Don't care what the number is, it's positive. So everybody in that interval is going to be positive, which tells me I'm increasing that interval. So classically, if I go down, hit the point, and go back up again, that proves that I have a minimum value at the point x equals 3 fourths. Does that make sense? But this is the kind of problem that screws students up, okay? We have all semester long beat you in the head with all the derivative formulas you're supposed to have memorized. Derivative, 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 derivative. And we have one little long section setting you guys up for calculus two. Calculus two is all about antiderivatives or integrals, okay? And so, this is a problem from chapter 4.7, the last section setting you guys up for calculus 2. You've got to know how to take the antiderivative or integral of a function. So the general antiderivative of the function f of x, if I'm going to take the antiderivative, I'm going to integrate the cosine of x plus 3e e to the x plus 2 over x, and I'm going to put dx because that's my variable. Well, this is pure memorization of the rules. You're going backwards, but there's a nice way to check, and I'll show you that in a second. Take the antiderivative, pure memorization. What is the antiderivative of cosine of x? Sine of x plus 3. What is the antiderivative? 3 is constant. Leave it alone. 
What is the antiderivative of EDX? <coughs> EDX. Plus 2 is a constant. Leave it alone. It's 2 over x, but 2 is a constant, so it's 2 times 1 over x. That's a special rule. What is the antiderivative of 1 over x? Natural log, officially absolute value of x. And anytime you're taking the antiderivative, what do you got to put? Plus c. <coughs> so, which one of these guys is my answer? Yeah, it looks like e to me. Okay. But, one good way of checking this, especially with the trig, because that screws some people up here. Because you'll notice, you know, with this one, it's kind of nice, because it's also the only one with natural log. But with trig especially, they'll put sign here, then they'll put negative sign as the next answer or stuff. They'd like to love to do that to you guys on the final exam. But here's a way to check. If I take the derivative of the antiderivative, what will I get back again? The original function. What's the derivative of sine x? It's cosine of x. What's the derivative of uh, 3 e to the x? Well, 3 is a constant. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. That's 3 e to the x. What's the derivative of uh, 2 natural log of x? Well, 2 is a constant. The derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. There it is. The derivative of a constant is 0, so I get back where I started from. Good way of checking it. Keep those derivative rules in your mind. All right. They should not have had to tell you this one on the next problem, but they're trying to give you guys a clue. Use L'Hopital's rule to evaluate the uh, event limit. As x approaches 0, v to the 2ax minus 1 minus 2ax all over x squared. All they needed to do was give you this one. Evaluate this. Evaluate the limit. Because what's the first rule you always use when you're taking a limit? Plug in a number. Let's see what we get when we plug in a number. Remember, what are you plugging 0 in for? What variable? X is a variable. A, anybody else in this case, A is a constant. Well, X is 0. 0 times 2A, well, A is a constant, so 0 times anybody is 0. E to the 0 is 1. Minus 1 is 0. 2 times A times 0 is still 0, so I get 0 on top over 0 squared, which is 0 on the bottom. So it's classic L'Hopital's rule because I got the indeterminate form 0 over 0. I'm only allowed to use L'Hopital's rule on 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. If I get one of these other guys, like, for example, 0 times infinity or infinity minus infinity, I'm, or a 1 to the infinity on these other style of indeterminate rules, you're going to have to play some algebra on these guys to be able to get them into L'Hopital rule form. So this one's straight up. All i got to do, L'Hopital's rule says, you take the limit as x approaches infinity, you take the root of the top and divide by the root of the denominator. So derivative of the numerator over derivative of the denominator. Derivative of e to a function is e to a function times derivative of the exponent. Remember, x is the variable. What's the derivative of 2ax? 2a, the constant. Derivative of minus 1 is 0. The autofocus work here. Derivative of minus 1 is 0. And what is derivative of minus 2ax? Minus 2a. All over derivative of x squared is 2x. Now, L'Hopital's rule, take the derivative of the numerator, divide by the derivative of the denominator, replug in your number. Plug in x is 0. 2a times 0 is 0, e to the 0 is 1, times 2a is 2a, minus 2a is oh, 0. Over 2 times 0 is 0. Wow, I get 0 over 0. What am I going to do? L'Hopital again. You can use L'Hopital's rule as many times as you need until you get an actual number. So, L'Hopital it again. This is the limit. As x approaches infinity of, derivative of the top. Well, 2a is a constant. Leave it alone. We're taking derivative of respect to x. Derivative of e to, a, e to the 2ax is e to the 2ax times derivative of the exponent, which is 2a. So I got another 2a times that 2a, which is a constant, minus, what's derivative of 2a? 0. There is no x in it. This is where most students screwed this problem up. You're taking derivative of respect to x. So if a term doesn't have x in it, Derivative is 0, and I did that for your benefit. And what's the derivative of 2x? That's actually 2. So when I clean this up, this is the limit as x approaches infinity of e to the 2a times x times 2a quantity squared all over 2. Now, let's plug in 0. 2a times 0 is 0. e to the 0 is 1 times 2a quantity squared all over 2. Well, 2a quantity squared is... 4a squared over 2, and 4 divided by 2 is 2. So cleaning this up, I get 2a squared, which is answer C. Does 
Does that make sense? Questions? <coughs> All right, here's another question from our last test. On which interval below is the function f of x equals 2x cubed plus 3x squared minus 36x decreasing? When they're asking you for intervals of increase or decrease, what are you going to do? Anytime they ask you for an interval, what are you going to always write? A number line. And they ask for intervals of increase and decrease, that number line is going to be dealing with what? First derivative. If they ask for intervals of concavity, that derivative is going to be the second derivative. Second derivative number line is concavity. First derivative number line is intervals of increase and decrease. They're asking for decreasing, so I'm going to do a number line on the first derivative. So my first derivative is going to be derivative of 2x cubed is 6x squared. Derivative of 3x squared is plus 6x. Derivative of minus 36x is minus 36. Remember, this is a no calculator section, so when you do these derivatives and stuff, they actually should clean up and work out nicely for you guys, because I don't have to use quadratic formula or anything like that on this stuff. Shouldn't be on the no calculator parts. So here we go, I've got this guy. I'm gonna find my critical number by setting him equal to zero and solving. I can factor out a six, that'll leave me with what? X squared plus X minus six <coughs> equals zero. Now, classic algebra, this should factor. How does X squared minus X minus six factor? Well, it's gotta be a difference, and the difference has to be one. What times what is six with a difference of one? Three and two. And because I want the uh, middle term to be plus, the bigger number is going to be plus. So it'll be plus 3 on the minus 2. Set each factor with an x in it equal to 0 and solve. I get x equals negative 3 and x equals positive 2. Okay? So right now, I got a feeling I don't see one answer. So pretty much b and c are not going to be an option for me to choose. Okay? But anytime they want an interval, I draw a number line. Okay, I'm going to put these numbers in order on there. Negative 3 and 2. That subdivides my interval. Now, pick a number inside between negative infinity to negative 3. I choose negative 4. Now, I'm going to plug it into my derivative. Now, you can either plug it into this guy, but that would actually make me have to crunch out numbers big in my head. Plugging it into this derivative, because it's the same thing, all I did was clean them up and factor them, would be a lot easier. So watch this. That'll be 6 times negative 4 plus 3 times negative 4 minus 2. Because we already remember, no calculator, so I'm going to have to plug these numbers into my head. But it's easier to plug it in into the factored form than it is to plug it into the big quadratic form. I'm showing you tricks of the trade. What's negative 4 plus 3? Negative 1. So this is 6 times negative 1. What's negative 4 minus 2? Negative 6. So what is 6 times negative 1 times negative 6? That's positive 36. Again, I don't care what the number is. What's the sign of it? That's why this factor form is helpful. Just keep up with the sign of what's going on here. What sign is this thing? It's positive, which tells me in that interval I'm increasing. Pick a number, use your brain, between negative 3 and 2. 0. So I'm going to plug in 0. Now, if I'm plugging in zero, now I could use the factor form, but this time I'm going to go back and use the old polynomial form because plugging in zero in this guy is real easy. What do you get? Negative 36. I don't care what the number is. It's negative. Pick a number bigger than two. I choose three. And again, plugging in the number three would be easier in the factor form. This would be six times three plus three times three minus two. 6 times 6 times 1, which is a back to a positive 36, is positive. Now, what was the question again? Find the intervals of where the, the function here is what? Decreasing. Where is it decreasing at? It's decreasing between negative 3 and 2. The answer is clearly D. Does that make sense? Questions? Next dude. Again, another good practice problem here. F of x is equal to the natural log of x divided by x. 
I am supposed to take the second derivative. But to be able to take the second derivative, I first have to take the first derivative. What rule would you use to take the first derivative? I see natural log of x divided by x. I'm going to use the quotient rule. Drew at the top. Drew natural log of x is 1 over x. Drew at the top times the bottom, x, minus the top, natural log of x, times drew at the bottom, which is 1, all over the bottom squared. Clean him up, though. f prime of x would be equal to 1 over x times x is what? 1 minus natural log of x times 1 is natural log of x, all over x squared. Now I'm after the second derivative, the derivative of the first derivative. My first derivative, after I clean them up, is 1 minus natural log of x over x squared. What rule would you take to rid of this guy? Quotient rule again. Drew the top times the bottom minus top times the bottom all over the bottom squared. Drew the top. Drew the 1 is 0. Drew the minus natural log of x is going to be minus 1 over x. Drew the top times the bottom x squared minus the top minus 1 minus the natural log of x. Time derivative of the bottom, derivative of x squared is 2x all over the bottom squared. So we're really learning your algebra skills now. Let's take a look and see what we get. This would be equal to, as I clean him up, negative 1 over x times x squared. Well, x squared divided by x is just x. That'll be negative x when you clean him up. This negative is going to distribute as well as the 2x is going to distribute. Negative 1 times 2x is going to be a negative 2x. And the negative 1 times a negative natural log of x times 2x is going to be, a negative times a negative is going to be a positive. Okay, 2x times natural log of x all over the bottom squared. x squared squared is x to the fourth. Clean them up. What is negative x minus 2x? Don't hurt yourselves. How many x's do I have? Minus 1x, minus 2x. Negative 3x. Negative 3x plus 2x natural log of x all over x to the fourth. Do you see that problem anywhere in here? Well, I got negative 3x. Oh, that's, that's not it. But wait a minute. What do I have in common on this numerator? I'm going to write him over here just to show you what I'm doing here. So the second derivative is negative 3x plus 2x natural log of x all over x to the fourth. Now, what I have in common in that numerator is each term has a what in it? Factor it out because you're going to clean him up. Factor, that leaves me with a factor of the x out. I get negative 3 plus 2 natural log of x over x to the fourth. And that x counts as with those four and leave me with three of them. With me? Therefore, my second derivative is negative 3x plus 2 natural log of x divided by x cubed. So do you see that problem anywhere in there? Yeah. That answer is answer, uh, be careful, negative 3x. Yeah, okay, so I think it's b. And take your time on circling your answers. But, so, let's take a look at this particular problem. It looked detailed, but actually, what was most of the problem? Was it really any difficult in taking these derivatives? Nah, it was the algebra that made you jump through some hoops to be able to get this one. And they're going to do the same thing to you guys on this final exam. We're always working those algebra skills. 60% of calculus is algebra. Does that make sense? All right. And you will notice that we have now just completed... Part number one. Now, I got started late because I had to turn on all the equipment and stuff out there. And I also was very long-winded and took my time so you guys could copy every problem that I did. And I didn't skip any steps at all. And I still finished part number one within about 35, 40 minutes from when I started. And I was long-winded and didn't take my time. And I was explaining this stuff and teaching it to you guys as I did it. So if I was actually doing this problem, honestly, most folks finish part one within about 30 minutes. That's on average. There's always the dude that finishes it in 15 minutes, but I wouldn't copy his paper. But uh, most folks, honestly, um, finish this part of the exam in about 30 minutes. You come up, you turn it in, you put it in the respective piles that we'll have set up, which we will organize and analyze, making sure you bubbled in everything correctly. 
But after that, you're going to get part number two, another bubble sheet that you fill in last name first, first name last. You'll fill in a little section that declares it's going to be the second part. So in case it gets lost, we can put it back in the right pile. You'll also have to bubble in your 800 number again under your student ID stuff information. And then you're going to start this guy. I still have 30 minutes or so before I'm even allowed to use a calculator, but this is the calculator section. Watch. Most of these problems, I won't even need a calculator on. Now, my calculator's way up here. So I'll grab it just to make myself feel good because I know how you guys are with these teddy bears, and just as long as you can hold it, you know you can get a right answer now. But the uh, fact is, I won't even have to use this thing on most of these problems. Let's take a look. So, part number two with the calculator. Start off. Okay. Let f of x be equal to x cubed plus 2. Then f inverse. The inverse of f of x is equal to what? Inverse. This is not even a calculus question. Now, granted, we covered it in chapter 3 when we, just, when we were uh, talking about logarithms being the inverse of the exponentials, and we talked about how to find inverses and stuff. So here's an inverse question, but it's actually a college algebra uh, pre-calculus style question here. So find an inverse. Step one, well, I need to graph this guy. I think I can look at him. This is x cubed squiggly line up to plus two, so it looks like this. I notice that the horizontal line test says this thing is one to one. What a big surprise there, checks. To find inverses, change the function. I'm giving you a step. Step one, make sure it's one to one. Step two, change function to y. y equals x cubed plus two. Step number three is the most important step on inverses. What do inverses do? They switch the x and y coordinate. So my next step is to switch the x and y. This gives me x is equal to y cubed plus 2. And then the next step is to do what? Solve for y. All right, what am I going to do to solve this thing for y? I'm going to subtract 2 from both sides. That gives me x minus 2 equals y cubed. What kills off a cube? Take the cube root of both sides. This cancels, leaving me with y is equal to the cube root of x minus 2. And the last thing is replace y with f inverse of x. So f inverse of x would be the cube root of x minus 2, which looks like the answer is c. I didn't need a calculator for that. And that's going to be the most of the case in these problems. It's only when they make you throw in a number on these things that they're going to have some interesting number crunching on it. All right, part number two. Well, question number two here says this. Which of the following functions are one-to-one? -one? Well, how do I define one-to-one? -one? Well, that would be nice if I could graph these guys. Now, you should actually have the basic graphs memorized. Now, granted, Let's say, for example, you're kind of all upset because your whole life depends on how well you do on this final exam, like most of you. So um, that's the case. You're all nervous about this thing now, and you're, I can't remember what x squared looks like. Oh, God. Okay, so, all right, fine, fine. Then if that's the case, you know what you do? We still, I, I still got another 25 minutes before I can get to my calculator. Then go to the next problem. Skip over them. It's all right. You can come back to them. You got part two and part three. You can... Do most of this thing if you need a calculator. Luckily, I do remember what x squared looks like. So x squared looks like this from between negative infinity to infinity. This is the graph of y equals x squared. The graph of 1 over x looks like this. 1 over x is that uh, hyperbola. Looks like this. Okay, and I do need to label my axis because... I'm being recorded and I want to make it look good in case one of my professor friends are watching me. All right, so there it is, x and y axis. This is the old parabola. This is the classic graph of 1 over x. And the e to the x, what does that sucker look like? Well, that's your classic exponential growth graph. Definitely should know that one goes to the point 0, 1, so it grows like this. So this is the graph of y equals e to the x. Always label your graphs. This is 1 over x here. Now, again, all of them except x equals 0 there. Good. Uh, and from negative infinity to infinity. So these are all my graphs accordingly. How do I tell when a function is 1 to 1? I just did it in the last problem. What do I need to do? The classic horizontal line test. 
And the horizontal line test says this. You graph a horizontal line. If it intersects the graph at more than one spot, it's not one-to-one. -one. A horizontal line should only intersect a one-to-one -one function in one spot. So let's take a look at this guy. Is this sucker one-to-one? One-to-one -one question mark. The answer is no. So I do not want this guy. Okay. Number two, is this guy one-to-one? -one? Intersects one spot, intersects one spot, intersects one spot. Any, any horizontal line I pick only intersects one spot. So the one-to-one -one question mark is yes. yes. And this is your classic exponential function here. E to the x. Uh, any horizontal line only intersects at one spot. So the one-to-one -one question mark is, of course, yes. So I want number two and I want number three. So the answer is two and three only. So the answer is D. Questions? Uh, one, I really didn't need a calculator for this, but honestly, maybe if you don't remember what the 1 over x graph looks like, okay, fine, then just move to the next problem and wait till 9 o'clock rolls around and I give you the official word that you can use your calculator, you can go back and do this problem. Sorry. All right, let's take a look at the next guy. And we got that font zero thing going on again. All right, here we go. Take the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared plus 7x minus 18 over x minus 2. First rule of limits. Chapter 1, day 1, when we covered this stuff, what is the first thing you always do with a limit? Plug in a number. Let's see what's going on here. So if I plug in this thing, this becomes 2 squared plus 7 times 2 minus 18 divided by 2 minus 2. 2 squared is 4. 7 times 4, uh, 7 times four is uh, 14 minus 18 over 2 minus 2. 4 plus 14 is 18 minus 18. What a surprise. 0 over 0. Now, with 0 over 0, there are two ways you can do this problem. I can do it the way we did it in Chapter 1, which was when I had 0 over 0, I always told my students to, quote, unquote, do algebra. You know 0 over 0 is going to cancel. So you can factor this thing and then clean it up. But, you know, we have gone through Chapter 3 here. And any time I got 0 over 0 and infinity over infinity, I have a special rule that's supposed to kind of help me out on all that algebra, which is what? L'Hopital's rule. So since this is a final exam, I would prefer showing you guys L'Hopital's rule. That's my classic code for L'Hopital's rule, the L apostrophe H. I'm going to take the limit as x approaches 2 in this problem of the derivative of the top, numerator over the derivative of the denominator. Derivative of x squared plus 7x minus 18 is 2x plus 7 over derivative of x minus 2 is 1. Then I plug in the number 2, x approaches 2, so it's 2 times 2 plus 7. 2 times 2 is 4 plus 7, officially divided by 1, which is equal to 11. The answer is E. And I really didn't need a calculator for that one. <coughs> Does that make sense? Questions? All right. Here we go. Take a look at this next guy. This next guy is the one that people started to really mess up on this final exam on. Take the limit as x approaches infinity of the square root of x squared plus 4x minus x. All right, first rule of limits, plug in infinity. Infinity squared is infinity. 4 times infinity is infinity. Infinity plus infinity is even bigger infinity. Square root of infinity is still infinity. Minus uh, x is infinity. So it's infinity minus infinity. So a ton of people said, well, therefore the limit doesn't exist. Well, no, that's not quite always true. fact is infinity minus infinity is an indeterminate form. We don't know what this thing's going on. You're going to have to do something or other on this guy. But he's not L'Hopital rule type. So what is the trick on doing something like this when I have infinity minus infinity in this example? What would you help me do if I'm taking limit as x approaches infinity of the square root of x squared plus 4x minus x? Well, when I want to turn things to L'Hopital's rule, I want things to be, be fractions. So, okay, I'll make it a fraction. There you go. Feel better now? It's all over one. Doesn't really help you out in terms of the fraction stuff, but there was a trick that we used when we had this kind of problem. What was my trick? Multiply by the conjugate. All right, let's do that trick then. I'm going to multiply by the conjugate. When I do the numerator, I do the denominator. What is the conjugate of the square root of x squared plus 4x minus x? Square root of x squared plus 4x plus x. Square root of x squared plus 4x plus x. So this will be the limit 
as x approaches infinity of, when I multiply conjugates, just remind yourself, when you, you have to fold it out, but the outer inner always cancels on conjugates, so all I have to do is multiply the first and, and then multiply the second. This, what's the square root of uh, x squared plus 4x times the square root of x squared plus 4x? x squared plus 4x. Square roots, quantity squared, cancel. Minus, multiply by minus x times positive x is a minus x squared. And 1 times the square root of x squared plus 4x is the square root of x squared plus 4x uh, plus x. Multiply it down to 1 the same thing. Clean it up. What cancels here? What's x squared minus x squared? Uh, it's 0. So this cancels. So now you're left with the limit as x approaches infinity of 4x divided by the square root of x squared plus 4x minus x. You with me so far? Ah, uh, plus x. Thank you. Careful. not paying attention to what I'm writing down. Plus x. So now I plug in infinity. If I plug in infinity, I'll get 4 times infinity, which is infinity. I get infinity squared plus 4 times infinity, which is infinity. Square root of infinity is still infinity. But now it's a plus infinity. And infinity plus infinity is just a bigger infinity. Infinity plus infinity is not really indeterminate. Infinity plus more infinity is bigger infinity. Right? So now it's infinity over infinity. So I got two options on this thing. I can do L'Hopital's rule now, if you want me to. Or I could do another trick, which was the old chapter, chapter one trick. Now, when do I want to use L'Hopital's rule? Now I could use L'Hopital's rule, because all I gotta do now is take the of the top, over to the bottom, and then replug in my limit, and I can get the answer. And that will work. So half you guys do that. If you want me to, I can also do the algebra trick from chapter one. Either way, I'm gonna get the right answer. Let me show you the algebra trick, and then if you want me to, I'll show you the L'Hopital rule trick. The algebra trick, when I have infinity over infinity with this type of stuff, is multiplied by 1 over x to the degree of the denominator. You remember that one? What is the degree of the denominator? Just want to practice you guys on algebra here. Right, well, the, the degree of the denominator is x to the first power, so it's x to the first. Now, this one is the square root of x squared, but the square root of x squared is still just x, and that's so it's x to the first power. So I'm going to multiply this thing by 1 over x here and 1 over x here. Now this is what we did in chapter 1. I'll show you what we did in chapter 3 in just a second. And you guys decide which way you like better. Okay? So here we go. When I do this, I'm going to distribute. This will be uh, the limit as x approaches infinity. 4x times 1 over x just makes it 4. Divided by, I want to distribute. The problem is when I distribute to get this x inside this radical, i got to rewrite him as 1 over the square root of x squared, which puts x squareds inside my guy. Does that make sense? And because I'm going to positive infinity, we're on the positive side. I don't have to worry about any pluses or minuses. I, I, it's going to be a positive. Remember, when we took the limit as x approaches negative infinity, we had to put a negative uh, the square root of x squared. Remember that trick. But uh, this is going to positive infinity. This is positive. This is positive. The x squared goes inside. This is the square root of x squared divided by x squared, which is 1. 4x divided by x squared is uh, 4 over x. But x times 1 over x is plus 1, because that's outside your radical. Now take the limit as x approaches infinity here. This thing goes to 0. And be careful on the algebra. Leaves me with a 4 over the square root of 1 plus 1. What's the square root of 1 plus 1? 2. And uh, that gives me 4 divided by 2, which is... 2. The answer is 2. Does that make sense? Now that was me doing the algebra, chapter 1 way, if you go back, and this is why I'm doing these reviews for you guys. I could have also done it another way. When I got infinity over infinity, what method could I have used? L'Hopital's rule. Alright, so I'm going to write him, continuing my problem down here, because this one looks like an easy problem to me. So hopefully, hopefully we won't need as much room. But I'm going to go back and put a little dotted line, so this is the same problem, and put it back to this level here. Take the limit as x approaches infinity of 4x divided by the square root of x squared plus 4x plus x. Now, when we plugged it in, we got infinity over infinity. I could have, and I'm going to slide up you guys can see this, and I'll blow it up a little bit bigger so you guys can see a little bit better on this thing, what I'm trying to do here. Oops, got me carried away there. Okay. 
All right, so this is my this is my problem after I clean them up. You with me so far? All right, so here's the deal. I could use L'Hopital's rule. Drew to the top, drew to the numerator, or drew to the denominator. Let's take a look at that. Now, I don't do square roots. That's a half a power. So I'm going to apply a L'Hopital rule here. This will be the limit as x approaches infinity. Uh, what's the derivative of 4x? 4 over chain rule. 1 half pops out front. The inside x squared plus 4x stays the same raised to negative 1 half. Time drew the inside, which is 2x plus 4. With me? Plus, drew the bottom. Drew to that x is 1. Don't forget that plus 1 back there. That's where most people would have screwed it up. Does that make sense so far? Clean him up. Negative exponents will go on the bottom. And this is an individual fraction. So this will be actually equal to the limit as x approaches infinity of 4 over, and this is going to be 2x plus 4 divided by 2 times the square root of x squared plus 4x, and this will be plus 1. Understand what I did there. I'm looking at this as its own individual fraction. This one negative one half power is a square root on the bottom. He'll be on the bottom of itself. So there's my square root guy right there. And then uh, that plus one. But this still would stay in the numerator, but the two is already down there, so I put the square root with the two. Now, take the limit as x approaches infinity on this guy. Well, see this one, I got a problem right in here. Does that make sense? So I'm going to still have to do kind of that trick. I can use L'Hopital's rule on this part and keep getting the same thing down here and then cleaning them up. You could get a common denominator and flip them up to do this thing. Does that make sense? But it's still going to be some major work. Now, on the, as you take the limit as x approaches infinity on this guy, uh, well, you're still going to have the same problem. It's going to be infinity over the square root of infinity, which is still infinity. So you see you're getting this recursive problem here. That's why I went ahead and did the algebra the first way, because I'm still going to have to analyze this guy by doing the 1 over the degree of the denominator. It's a little easier. I multiply the top by 1 over x and the bottom by 1 over x. And that would end up being 1 over the x squared guy and doing the same trick that I did a few seconds ago, which is the limit as x approaches infinity of 4 over 1, uh, 2x times 1 over x is uh, just 2 plus 4 over x divided by 2 times the square root of 1 plus 4 over x plus 1. And now when you plug in uh, x goes to infinity, all the little fractions go to 0 here, and you're left with pretty much... That's plus 1 back here. You're left with 2 over 2, which is 1, times the square root of 1, which is 1. So that becomes 1 plus 1, which is 2. So we're still back to 4 divided by 2, which is 2. And th that's why I wanted to show you this one. Did L'Hopital rule really help me out with this problem, is my point. No, I still had to end up doing that 1 over x to the power bit. The chapter 1 way was the best way to do this problem. That's why I'm trying to show you both ways. Does that make sense? So, again, but you can see in this kind of a problem when people automatically invent a different infinity, I'm going to use L'Hopital's rule. Well, yeah, if it helps out, great. But sometimes it doesn't. Here's an example of that. That's why they put this on the test, making sure that you can go both ways with this thing. Okay? All right, let's take a look at the next guy. Let me blow him up here. Right here. All right. Suppose that f prime of x is equal to 2x plus 3 over x squared. And f of 1 equals fine. Find a formula for f of x. What kind of problem is this guy? Antiderivative. They're giving you the derivative and they're asking you about f of x, the antiderivative. So, here we go. So f of x, by definition, is the antiderivative or integral of the derivative. So f of x would be equal to the antiderivative of 2x plus, anytime I got x to a power in the denominator, I always want to bring him up top. The only time I leave him in the bottom is if it's 1 over x, because the antiderivative of 1 over x is natural log of x. Any kind of x to a power in the denominator, we want to turn it into this x to the n so we can apply the quote-unquote power rule, which is x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 when you take the antiderivative or integral. So this would be plus 3x to the negative 2, brought him up, 
dx. So, what is the antiderivative of 2x? Well, 2 is a constant. Leave them alone. What's the antiderivative of x to the first power? x squared over 2 plus 3 is a constant. Leave them alone. Draw the antiderivative of x to the negative 2. Add 1 over add 1. That's x to the negative 1 over negative 1. Okay, add 1 over add 1. But don't forget, when you take an antiderivative, what do you have to do? Plus C. Okay? So, clean them up. F of X is equal to, this cancels, X squared. Clean this up. This is negative 3. 3 divided by negative 1 is negative 3. X negative 1 is X on the bottom plus C. So, there's my answer. But I also have to figure out what plus C is. What information are we given to help us out with plus C? What we call the initial condition. F of 1 equals 5. When I plug in 1, F of 1, that'll be 1 squared minus 3 over 1 plus C. That's supposed to be equal to 5. Watch the careless errors. 3 divided by 1 is 3. 1 squared is 1. 1 minus 3 is negative 2 plus C equals 5. Solve for C. Add 2 to both sides, and what do I get for C? 7. Therefore, my answer is f of x is equal to x squared minus 3 over x plus c, and that would be plus 7, which is answer d. <coughs> Any questions, complaints, comments? Okay. Suppose that f is conti a continuous function and f of 0 equals negative 1, f of 1 equals 1, f of 2 equals 4, f of 3 equals 8, f of 4 equals 6. Which of the following must contain a solution of f of x equals 3? This one right here um, gave tons of people problems. Okay? Because they didn't know what to do. Well, we're going to try to throw problems at you guys that you've never seen before. And that's kind of the whole goal of the final exam. Because the people that know calculus can apply that calculus. That's what we're after. Remember, this is engineering calculus. We want you guys to have the ability to take a problem that you've never seen before, take the rules that you know, and apply to it. All right. So I know I have a continuous function. All right. And I know this. These are x-coordinates, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. All right. F of 0 is negative 1. So F of 0 is down here at negative 1. F of 1 equals 1. There's 1 equals, and I'm probably going to make these guys small here, equals 1. Okay. F of 2 equals 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. There's 4 right there. F of 2 equals 4. F of 3 equals 8. 5, 6, 7, 8. So that's way up here. There's 8. And then F of 4 is equal to 6. So I'm back down here. Now, I have these points. All right. We were given what kind of function? A continuous function. What does that mean? Well, it may be differentiable, maybe not. I don't know anything about that. But continuous means I don't get to lift my pencil from the paper. That means at every point in the interval between 0 and 4, every, let's see, the limit exists, the functional value exists, and they're going to be equal to each other. Remember your definition of calculus definition of continuous. But basically, I don't get to lift my pencil from my paper. So it's going to look something like this. Okay, maybe a little more wiggles in it, but I don't care. They, they, they touch. They, I, I cut across each point. Now, the question is, is this. Where does the function f of x equal 3 at? f of x equals 3. Well, this, remember, f of x is the y coordinate. This is the y part of a function. So 3, there's 4. 3 is right about there. 
Okay? Where must they be a solution at? Well, the solution must be here. Does that make sense? It's part of what we call Rolle's theorem, in case you want to know what I'm really applying here. So, because the derivative, if it's 3 here, that's kind of horizontaling out here. But what, where is that interval going to be at? Between what two points? The answer is between 1 and 2. Does that make sense? Was it hard? Oh, but people had no idea what to do with this one because never seen a problem. This was not on any of my calculus exams. Yeah, exactly. And some of these problems are going to throw at you aren't going to be on there. But you have, the, you have your brain. Figure it out. Does that make sense? All right. Take a look at the next guy. This one you did see on one of your calculus exams. Suppose that f of x is equal to x squared minus 4 over x minus 2 when x is not equal to 0 and k when x equals 0. Determine the value of k that makes the uh, function continuous. Now this is your calculus definition of continuous, chapter 1. All right, for a function to be continuous, let's talk about that word. Make sure you remind yourself of this stuff. Continuous, okay? We have this at x equals a. f of x continuous x equals a. Number one, the limit as x approaches a of f of x has to exist. Number two, f of a has to exist. And the third condition on being definition of continuity is the limit as x approaches a of f of x has actually to be equal to the f of a value. So the dot fills in the quote unquote hole. This was my definition of continuous. So, we know this. I'm going to take the limit as x approaches, uh, uh, in this case my breaking point is at 2, of f of x. And remember the definition of what a limit is. Limit means I'm getting very, very close to 2 of a particular function and we're trying to figure out what's going on, what's the y value. That's the whole idea behind a limit. We're getting very close. We're not going to be 2. Because two's got a problem. So I'm going to get very, very close. I'm going to get very close to two and to figure out where the function's going at. So if I'm not quite two, but I'm close to two, which piece of my piecewise function do I get to use? Top piece or bottom piece? Well, the top piece is I get to plug in x is when you're not two. I get to plug it into the bottom piece when x actually equals two. We're not two. We're very close to two. So I get to use the top piece. This will be the limit as x approaches two of x squared minus 4 over x minus 2. You'll notice when you plug in 2 into this thing, 2 squared is 4 minus 4 is 0. Over 2 minus 2 is 0. So I got 0 over 0 in determinate form. I can either do algebra, which is easy algebra to do. I can factor it. It'll be x plus 2 times x minus 2. And the x minus 2's cancel. Or I could use what? L'Hopital's rule. Anytime I got 0 over 0, infinity over infinity, I can use it. Most of the time it helps. There's occasionally some crappy problems out there that it doesn't help. But here we go. I think L'Hopital's rule is the easiest way to go on this one. So I'm applying L'Hopital's rule. This will be the limit as x approaches 2 of 2x divided by 1, drew to the top over to the bottom. Plug in 2, and what do I get? 4. So the limit value has got to be equal to 4. The functional value at 2, that's me literally plugging 2 into this thing. If I plug 2 into my function, what do I get? If I plug 2 in my piecewise function, I get the k constant value. And step number 3 says that the limit value, which we got to be 4, has to be equal to the functional value, which we got to be k. So to answer my question here, what's k equal to? The answer is a, 4. Does that make sense? The limit has to be equal to the functional value. So what you do is you take the limit of this part and set it equal to, in this case, k. Number eight, again, analyzing piecewise functions, chapter one limit stuff. Let f of x be equal to piecewise function x plus one when x is less than or equal to zero, and three x plus two when x is greater than zero. Take the limit as x approaches zero from the plus side of f of x. If I'm taking the limit as x approaches zero from the plus side, understanding limits is all this question is about. This means I'm going to zero slightly bigger than zero. Which piece of my piecewise function do I get to plug x's into if I'm slightly bigger than zero? 
top piece or bottom piece? X is greater than zero is the bottom piece. So that'll be the function that I use. 3X plus 2. And what's the first rule of limits? Plug in the number. X is going to zero on the plus side. 3 times zero on the plus side is still zero. Plus 2 is 2. That's pretty much my answer. Just have to know, understand what a one side limit means. I get to plug in on one side, and it's the positive side of zero, and the positive side greater than zero is the 3x plus 2. Okay? All right. Here is the application of what you have to know about the definition of derivative. They love to throw this on the, the free response part of the test, and this is how they throw it in on the multiple choice part of the test. <laughs> All right, why they put it in this section and not the no calculator section, because I haven't even turned on my calculator yet. It's embarrassing. But okay, to let you know, this is a real exam. Here we go. F of x is equal to e to the 2x. Then f prime of a equals what? Now, you're thinking, well, I should just take derivative and plug in a. Yeah, that's what, yeah, but look at the answers. What are they asking for? It's the answers that set up this problem. What are they asking for? The limit is h goes to a of something. The limit is h goes to zero or something. Or other. What are we actually doing here? It is the definition of derivative. Remember the definition of derivative. f prime of x was equal to, what was the definition of derivative you have memorized? It is the limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. That was my definition of derivative at our arbitrary value x. There were two other types of definition derivative. There was the definition of derivative evaluated at point a. You would take the limit as h approaches zero of f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. There was one third definition of derivative. And it was also evaluated at point a. It was the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a. There were three definitions of derivatives. This was the definition derivative of a function. This is the definition of derivative at a point a. And this is also the definition of derivative at a point a. Yes, we expect you to have these memorized. Okay? Now, which one of these three am I going to use for this problem? And it's all in, not the question, but how they set up the answers. Which one? One, two, or three? It's number two. Number one deals with x's, so you're actually expecting to get, you know, e to the x-ish type of thing, an x in your answer. This one's going to be a numerical value, the derivative at a point. This is the, der the derivative quote unquote slope of the tangent line at a point type thing here and so is this one and it's the limit this one is limit as x approaches a form this is the limit as h approaches zero form and the answers are they got h's in them that's why this is my guy so f prime of a is equal to the limit as h approaches zero of f of a plus h minus f of a all over h now f of x was given to be e to the 2x. So what would f of a be equal to then? If f of x is equal to e to the 2x, what's f of a? e to the 2a. And therefore also, what would f of a plus h be equal to? e to the whatever's inside of the parentheses you replace x with. That would be 2 raised to the a plus h. Okay? So here we go. This is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of e to the 2 times a plus h minus f of a, which is e to the 2a, all over h. Does that make sense? So that 2 right there is the page number. So that will be equal to the only thing I could really do to this thing to try to make it look like one of my guys here is what? I can distribute the 2. Okay, so this would be e to the 2a plus 2h minus e to the 2a all over h. Does any one of these guys look like my answer? 
I believe it looks like D. Here's the deal. Out of this problem, you know how many people percentage-wise circled answer E? And because it looks like the same thing except for one thing. What did they ask for? They asked for F prime of A, which is this formula. This formula has what in it in the, in the numerator? Uh, e to the what? 2X plus H minus E to the 2X over H. This is not the F prime of A form. What is this prime? What is this? This is F prime of X form. Does that make sense? It's got X's in here. They want F of A, so the answer should have A's in here. So this should have been eliminated right from the get-go as far as an answer. And this one should have been eliminated right from the get-go because limit H doesn't go to A. It actually goes to zero in my form. So E and A should have been eliminated immediately. But a lot of people weren't paying attention and they wanted the derivative and they thought and they used this form where it says clearly F prime of A, which is this form is the one you should have used. Does that make sense? Okay. Number 10. Again, I'm try I am being a little bit long-winded on this one, but I'm making sure you understand every question to go through. A very detailed covering of this final exam. The next one is this. And the other thing that you guys should be doing as you are studying for this exam, as you go through more exams, is a problem like this next one. Every time you do a problem that requires a special formula, like the last one we just did, and this one, you should be writing down that formula because you don't get anything except your brain coming to this exam. This is calculus. Memorize everything. This is another problem that you have to memorize the form. It says this, find the linear approximation for the function f of x equals x plus the sine of 2x at a equals pi halves. <coughs> what is the formula for the linear approximation? Remember this, the linear approximation formula is L of x is equal to f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. This is your linearization formula. So anytime they ask for linearization, this is your guy. But remember this, if you get lost and you get confused, remember me telling you all about it. Linearization is a fancy word for find the equation of the tangent line. It's the same form, they just made it very special and called it L of x. But if you get lost, just find the equation of the tangent line, it's going to be the same answer. Okay? So, but this one, I'm going to write it in this form here. So I got a function. F of x is equal to x plus the sine of 2x. I need to take the derivative. What's the derivative of x? 1. What's the derivative of sine of 2x? Well, it's the chain rule because I got something other than just x as an angle. Derivative of sine x is what? Cosine of x, but this is the sine of an angle. Derivative of sine of an angle is cosine of the angle times the derivative of the inside. So derivative of sine x is cosine of, in this case, 2x. Sine, derivative of sine of 2x is cosine of 2x times the derivative of the inside, which is 2. But now they told me a over here. So f of a would be equal to, a is pi halves, so f of pi halves would be pi halves plus the sine of 2 times pi halves. This would be equal to pi halves plus the sine of, what is 2 times pi halves? Pi. And what is the sine of pi? What is the sine of pi? Well, they could have put this on the no calculator section. Luckily for the folks last semester, it was in the calculator section for the people who don't have their unit circle memorized. But it very well could have been put on the no calculator section. What is the sine of pi? Very good. It's zero. So this is equal to pi halves. Now what is f prime of a? In this case, f prime of pi halves would be equal to 1 plus the cosine of 2 times pi halves times 2. This will be 1 plus 2 times pi halves is just pi. So that's the cosine of pi times 2. What is the uh, cosine of pi? 
What is it? Negative 1. So this is 1 plus negative 1 times 2. Negative 1 times 2 is negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. So now, just to save space, I'll write them up here. Plugging it in, my linearization is equal to f of a. f of my functional value is pi halves. Plus f prime of a. f prime of a is negative 1 times x minus a. x minus an a was pi halves. Does that make sense? Clean him up. My linearization equation would be equal to pi halves minus x plus pi halves. What's pi halves plus pi halves? Pi halves plus a pi halves. You got half a pi plus another half a pi. What you got for Thanksgiving? Whole pi. Very good. All right. Minus x. Does that make sense? And so the answer is clearly. That lose you guys anywhere. So again, this is why we didn't cover everything that you, you covered in Calculus 1 on this final exam. This is why you want to cover other final exams. So when they throw these other kind of problems that, that require a special form, you review those and make sure you memorize and know how to apply all these special forms. Let's take a look at the next guy. Number 11. Determine whether the function F, uh, f of x equals x e to the negative x is concave up. What does concave up deal with? Second derivative. And they're talking about determine where, and they're given the answer in intervals. What a surprise. Anytime they ask for concavity, it's going to be in intervals, which means I want to draw a number line. But I've got to draw a number line for concavity with the second derivative. So take, to figure out the second derivative, I first have to take the first derivative. So what rule am I going to use to take derivative of x times e to the negative 4x? Product rule, draw the first, derivative of x is 1, draw the first times the second, e to the negative 4x plus the first, x times derivative of the second. Derivative of e to the negative 4x is e to the negative 4x times the derivative of the exponent, which is negative 4. Does that make sense? Clean them up. This is equal to e to the negative 4x times 1 minus 4x e to the negative 4x. What do I have in common over here? I got e to the negative 4x minus 4x e to the negative 4x. Well, I got an e to the negative 4x in common. I factor it out, I'm left with 1 minus 4x. Does that make sense? But that is my first derivative. I got to take a derivative again. I want f double prime of x. So again, I'm using the product rule. Derivative the first, e to the negative 4x times negative 4. Derivative the first times the second, times 1 minus 4x, <coughs> plus the first, which is e to the negative 4x, times the derivative of the second. Derivative of 1 minus 4x is negative 4. Clean him up. All right? What do I have in common between these two terms. I have a negative 4 e to the negative 4x in common. When I factor it out, I will be left with 1 minus 4x here. When I factor it out here, what do I got? I pull this entire thing out, but what do I have for placement? Plus 1. When you factor the entire thing out, you got plus 1. Does that make sense? All I'm doing is playing old high school algebra here. So far, so good. Clean them up some more. This tells me f double prime of x is equal to negative 4 e to the negative 4x times, what is 1 plus 1? 2 minus 4x. To find intervals of concavity, the first thing I have to do is get my second derivative. The second thing I have to do is set it equal to zero to find these possible inflection points. Does that make sense? So I'm going to set this equal to zero. 
But remember what we did in class. When you got something factored and you said equal to zero, you said each factor equal to zero. But one of your factors is e to the negative 4x. When does an e to anybody ever equal zero? It doesn't. Let's do it in our heads. If I set e to the negative 4x equal to zero, what kills off e's? Natural log both sides. But then you have to take the natural log of zero. And then you can only take the log of positive numbers. The natural log of zero does not exist. It's an error button on your calculator. Does that make sense? But I'm telling you this because I don't want to write all this stuff down because I don't have much room left. So e is not going to give you any kind of zeros. What factor is going to give you the you can solve for x? Well, I would not, I said that equal to zero wouldn't exist. I would just set this equal to zero. 2 minus 4x equals zero. And that would give me x is equal to what? 1 half. Very good. Add 4x and then divide by 4. Does that make sense? So I got x is equal to a half. Now, they did ask me for the intervals of concavity. So here we go. Running out of room here, but don't worry, I think I have plenty of room, so I'm just going to put my little line here so you guys don't get confused. Drawing my number line on this thing, I'm going to put x as one half because there's my critical point, and that's it. It's only one of them. And this is going to be dealing with the second derivative. So I need a number less than the one half to plug into my second derivative. I have a brain, therefore I shall choose zero. Plugging zero into my second derivative, which is... A second derivative is right here. This would be negative 4 e to the negative 4 times 0 <coughs> times 2 minus 4 times 0. But remember, by this time, I'm sure I, gotta use, I can use the calculator at some point, but I don't think I still need a calculator on this thing. Negative 4 times 0 is 0. e to the 0 is 1. So that goes 1. 4 times 0 is 0. 2 minus 0, well, that's 2. That's negative 4. Negative 4 times 1 times 2 is negative 8. I don't care what the number is. What's the sign of it? It's negative. Pick a number bigger than a half. I choose 1. When I plug in 1 in this thing, I get negative 4e to the negative 4 times 1 times 2 minus 4 times 1. And just to show you, I could do this without a calculator, but I will put it on my calculator just to show you. Four, 2 minus 4 is negative 2 times that negative 4 is a positive 8. So this is 8e to the negative 4. And that's going to be a positive number. So this is positive. But if you don't believe me, sure. I just want to make you guys feel good that I actually turned on my calculator on this exam. So here we go. I'm going to get uh, negative 4 times e to the negative 4 times 1, which is negative 4, okay, times 2 minus 4, two, 2 minus 4 times 1, and I get, this is what that number is, 0.1465, whatever. It's still a positive number, so here's the deal. Oh yeah, what was the question on this problem? What is the intervals of what? Concave up. What does concave up mean to you guys? Got to have positive second derivative. So it's positive, so the answer is between 1 half and infinity. And that is answer, which one? 1 half to infinity? Answer is D again. Does that make sense? Well, take a look at the next problem. And write down another thing to make sure that you have memorized. And look at the answers on this one. They're crappy decimals. Yay, a problem I can use my calculator on. All right. We wish to solve x to the fourth minus 25 using Newton's method. Use x1 equals 2 as your initial approximation and find x2 the next approximation. You're not being asked to find the exact solution. We're asking you to actually just use Newton's method. So what is Newton's method? Well, Newton's method... is xn plus 1 is equal to xn minus f of xn divided by f prime of xn. Again, right off of your last test. So, on this problem, <coughs> f of x is equal to x to the fourth minus 25. 
Remember, with Newton's method, you always set the function equal to zero. That's what sets up the function. Okay? The next one is this. Take the root. That'll be 4x cubed. And they told me to, they gave me x1. x1 was equal to 2. So the next iteration, which would have been x2, would be equal to x1 minus f of x1 over f prime of x1. So x2 would be equal to x1 is 2 minus f of 2 over f prime of 2, which would be 2 minus f of 2. Okay? Plug in 2 into this thing. 2 to the 4th power. Yay, calculator time. 2 to the 4th power is 16. 16 minus 25 is? 16 minus 25 is negative 9. So I get negative 9 here for f of 2. And f prime of 2, well, let's see here, that's 2 cubed. What's 2 cubed? 8. 8 times 4 is? 32. And just to show you, I used a calculator. 4 times 2 cubed. Yay, 32. All right, so here we go. Now, all i got to do now is crunch this, and they want me to do two decimal places on this guy. So this would be equal to 2 minus negative 9 divided by 32. Oops, let me show you my calculator here. Typing in exactly what I see here. 2 minus negative 9 divided by 32, which is, I got 2.2. 8125. Now which one would that be closest to? 2 point what? 2.28. There's my answer. Yes, sir. Well, this one, they gave you x1 equals 2. They gave you the initial condition. All right, but let's say they got a problem here of, let's see if I remember it here. On one of your tests, they gave you this one. Here's a function, they set it equal to zero. E to the negative x minus f x minus five or something like that. They want you to find the solution when e to, the, uh, e to negative x minus x minus five equals zero, okay? Well, Newton's method looks for x-intercepts, roots, zeros. Use whatever word you want to use, okay? It uses x-intercepts, roots, zeros. So I would go zoom six and go graph this thing. And there it is right there. So what would you use as your first initial point? You could use zero. Personally, I use negative one. Get close. Negative one seems to be the x. It's crossing the x-axis pretty darn close to negative one. The closer you get as your initial guess, the less iterations you actually have to do before it really zooms in on your answer. The farther away you are, the more apt you are to screw this problem up because it takes more iterations. And if you go too far away, your slope's not going to zoom back in and kind of project you towards that uh, x-intercept that you need it to be. You have to pick a point that's quote-unquote close. So I graph it. But let's take a look at this problem. How else? I'm going to ask you this question. This is off the... Off the uh, the question here, but how else could they have asked this question? They could have asked this question this way. All right. The fourth root of 25. Okay. Use Newton's method to approximate the fourth root of 25 with your initial guess being 2. They didn't give me a function with that statement, you understand. What is the fourth root of 25? How do I use Newton's method to do this? Well, to do Newton's method, you actually have to create the function. So to create the function, you would set x equal to the fourth root of 25 and then work backwards to try to create a function. What gets rid of fourth roots? Fourth powers. So I could take the fourth power of both sides. You with me? Fourth root and fourth power cancel. 
That gives me x to the fourth actually equals 25, if you think about it. And Newton's method, to create the function, you have to set it equal to what? Zero. So I would subtract 25 from both sides. And I could say x to the fourth minus 25 had to be my Newton's method formula, which is what they gave me up here. So they could have changed the question up by saying, use Newton's method to approximate the fourth root of 25 using with your first iteration x1 equals 2 and giving me the second iteration. That forces you to actually get the function out of it. That's another way we could ask you the problem. It's again out thinking the question. Does that make sense? And this was another well work question in case you don't can't remember. Take a look at the next guy. Well it's about time we've done one of these guys. What is it? Suppose we got x cubed times y plus y squared equals 4x plus 2. You with me? Find the derivative of dy dx at the point 1, 2. What kind of derivative do I have to do on this thing? What kind of differentiation do I have to do? Implicit differentiation. Because this guy's kind of a nasty function, so I can't get y by himself. So I'm going to use, good practice here, just to remind yourself of the wording, implicit differential equation, uh, di differ, uh, derivative here, implicit derivative. So here we go. I've got x cubed times y plus y squared equals 4x plus 2. You jump in with both feet and take derivative respect to x. But you have to remember that you're going to have to sit there and every time you take derivative of y, tack on that dy dx and look at the world as products and quotients to use the product rule and quotient rule. So first thing I see is x cubed times y. That's a product. I'm use the product rule. Draw the first times the second plus the first x cubed times the second. What's the root of y? Well, it's 1 dy over dx. Draw the first times the second plus the first times the second. Plus y squared by himself. What's the root of y squared? Well, the root of y squared is 2y what? dy dx. Every time you take the root of a y, you've got to tackle on that times dy dx. Equals, what is the root of 4x? 4. And what's the root of plus 2? 0. Now, it's up to you. There's two ways to do this problem. I can actually solve for dy dx and then plug in my point. But if you want to save some time, you can go ahead and remember, you're supposed to find dy dx when x equals 1 and y equals 2. <coughs> Does that make sense? So, here we go. I'm going to solve for dy dx because I think you're going to see some problems like this before and it's good practice. But go ahead and plug in the numbers right now and see if we don't get the same answer at the end of the day. If I'm solving for dy dx, I'm going to subtract 3y squared, 3x squared y from both sides. 3x squared y from both sides. This cancels leave me with x cubed times dy over dx plus 2y dy over dx would be equal to 4 minus 3x squared y. Now I'm going to factor out that dy dx. That would leave me with x cubed plus 2y is equal to 4 minus 3x squared y. Now I'm going to divide. This would give me dy over dx would be equal to 4 minus 3x squared y divided by x cubed plus 2y. There's my answer, but I'm supposed to evaluate this answer at the point 1, 2. x is 1, y is 2. So now I'm going to come over here and do that. So dy over dx would be equal to 4 minus 3 x is 1, that will be 1 squared times y, which is 2, divided by x cubed, 1 cubed, plus 2 times y, and y is 2. I plugged in x is 1 and y is 2 into my derivative. Cleaning them up, 1 squared is 1, times 2 is 2, times 3 is 6, so this is 4 minus 6, 1 cubed is 1, 2 times 2 is plus 4. 4 minus 6 is negative 2. 1 plus 4 is 5. I get the answer negative 5 halves. And so the answer is clearly D. Does that make sense? 
And if you plugged it in right here and then just solved for it, you would have gotten the exact same answer. Now, notice something rather. I have just finished up part two, multiple choice section with a calculator. Looking at my clock and my watch, and I notice that I have been very long-winded in my explanations because I am trying to review you guys on this stuff and talking about and trying to show never miss a step. That's one thing my students can always say is, no, John never skips a step when he's doing this algebra. Most professors do because they expect you guys to actually know the algebra. Being that I'm actually from a North Carolina public high school, I know where you guys are coming from, so I don't skip a step <laughs> in trying to show you guys everything. Now, that being the case, I still have an hour left on this exam. Understand? And I still got part three to go. Part three is typically five to six questions. Every semester they change. Five, six questions. And remember, show your work. Show all details of your work because just in case you screw something up, if we the professors can try to figure out what you're trying to do, you can maybe get some partial credit off of it. We do grade on partial credit. But you know what no work means? It's the easiest thing in the world to grade. Now, you guys are in my class and Desiree's class and Liz's class. Remember, you represent us. Don't embarrass us. Number two, one, there's no reason to put crappy comments on the exam. I've never seen a problem like this before. This is stupid. We don't need to see that. I like to read those kind of questions from other people's students, not my own. Okay, because I figure out who you are in my class and I'll pay you back. All right, number two <laughs> is this. All right. You know something about every problem. Write something down. You only show your ignorance when you leave a problem completely blank. You know something. This is calculus one. Worst case scenario, take a derivative of it. I don't care. Do something. My God, man. Don't leave anything blank. The least you can do is show something or other because if you start writing out some stuff, maybe it'll come to you what the connection is supposed to be and what they're asking you to do. Because they are going to try to throw some problems at you guys you may have never seen before. They're trying to get you guys to think outside the box in terms of how to be able to solve a particular problem. Because you are the science majors. This is your life. This is why you're here. So let's take a look at this thing. All right. First problem, they gave you a picture of a graph. The graph of y equals f prime of x is shown. Know that this is the uh, graph of the derivative of f. Pay very close, and close attention to that. Because people get confused because they think this is f. This is not f. What is this graph of? <coughs> f prime. This is f prime graph. All right? So they're going to make you guys think outside the box. This idea of relationship stuff. On which intervals is f increasing? You're, remember, you're being asked about f and not f prime. That is the graph above. And on which intervals is f concave up? Now, f increasing. f increasing. And we're they're asking about f, and they gave me the, uh, the idea about f prime. For f to be increasing, what calculus do we know? This is what we expect you guys to write down. For f to increase, I'm looking where the derivative is greater than zero. That is the definition of f to be increasing. f decreasing is where the first derivative is less than zero. Does that make sense? Second derivative deals with concavity. Po second derivative positive, that's concave up. Second derivative negative, that's concave down. But f increasing means the derivative is greater than zero. So, where is the derivative? This is the derivative graph. To be greater than zero, that means, remember this is your y or f prime. f prime to be greater than zero, has got to be above the x-axis. Does that make sense? Because this is the y or f prime axis because this is the graph of f prime. y equals f prime. So this is your y or f prime axis here. So to be greater than zero, we want to figure out what's above the x-axis. Where is this graph above the x-axis? It is on this interval, which is from negative infinity to negative two. It is also in this interval in here. It is above the x-axis, a.k.a the derivative is greater of, above the x axis, greater than zero, which is between zero and three. And there's my answer. You're right. On a lot of these problems, here's the deal. That's, that's the only work I have to show is writing down the answers because it's your idea of the interpreting the graph. So when we were grading this thing, 
There wasn't much partial credit to be handed out. You either knew it or you didn't know it. Next one. On which intervals is F concave up? Now, again, writing down the concept. What does concave up mean to you guys? That is where the second derivative is greater than zero. But they gave me the graph of the first derivative. So I got to look at the world through the first derivative concept. So inter intuitively, this will be where the derivative of the derivative is greater than zero. They gave me the graph of f prime. I want its derivative to be greater than zero. When I'm looking at a graph and talking about its derivative, we're talking about the slope of the tangent line. So we want the slope. So in other words, I'm looking where the slope of f prime is greater than zero, which means it's got to be increasing. Where is this graph increasing at? It is increasing, going up between this point and this point. That's where the graph is going up. All my slopes are going up. It's negative slope here. It has a negative slope here. Does that make sense? So what <coughs> interval is that between what? Negative 1 and 2. And that is my answer. Does that make sense? Did I lose you anywhere? All right, next one. Quote, does F have any uh, relative local minima? If so, list the X coordinates of the relative minima. Okay, minima, minimum. First off, how do I get a minimum? Well, first off, I got to have a critical number, so I got to figure out where the derivative is equal to what? Zero, and to be a minimum. I got to go down and then go back up at that particular point, which means I have to have a negative slope or negative derivative there, right? The derivative has to be negative, and then after I hit the point, the derivative has to be greater than zero. Just talking about the concept of what it means to be a minimum point. Does that make sense? Well, first off, I got to figure out where the derivative is equal to zero. You take, to find where the derivative is equal to zero, you take the derivative set it equal to zero. Now we're talking about, we got only thing we got is the graph. Where is the graph of a function equal to zero at? We call those things what? X-intercepts. It is at this point, this point, and this point. So the derivative is equal to zero at the points X equals negative two, X equals zero, and X equals three. So my choices are going to be, it's either negative 2, 0, or 3. Does that make sense? Which one is going to be a minimum? You've got to look at the slope. The derivative has got to go, has to be negative and then positive. Over here, the derivative, remember this is the derivative graph. The derivative is above the x-axis. Here the derivative is below, where it's negative, the x-axis. Here the derivative is above the x-axis and the derivative is below. So if you really want me to, I'm gonna write it out on a number line so you guys can see what's going on here. Putting my numbers here, negative two, zero, and three. Less than negative two. Remember, this is the graph of F prime. And the graph is above the x-axis, which means X prime is positive. Above the x-axis means it's positive. Between negative two and zero, it's negative. Between zero and three, it's positive. And between 3 and infinity, we're back below the x-axis, so it's negative. Which means I'm doing what? I am increasing, then I am decreasing, then I am increasing, then I am decreasing. What kind of point does that make negative 2? If I go up, hit negative 2, and then go back down again. This is a max. If I go down, hit 0, and then go back up, that makes this guy a minimum. If I go up, hit 3, and go back down again, I'm back to having a maximum. They wanted to know where the minimum was at. So what's the answer? X equals, zero. X equals zero. It was supposed to give the X coordinate. And notice how I circle my answers to let the grader, like myself, who has to grade 2,000 of these things, know exactly where my answer is with all my work right around it. Does that make sense? Because if we have to look more than, I don't know, 10 seconds at your problem to figure out what you're trying to do here, and we're confused, how many points do you think you're going to get? Not many, but if I can figure out what you're trying to do right from the get-go, and then the points will start adding up quickly. All right? What's the next one? 
you are supposed to sketch the graph of the second derivative. <clears throat> All right. Second derivative here. Now I'm going to put my same numbers in here, so I'm trying to kind of line this stuff up. So this will be negative 3, here's negative 2, here's negative 1, there's obviously 0, here's 1, here's 2, here's 3. This is the kind of way they drew it up here. I'm trying to reflect this thing down. Now, what? okay, so we're trying to go after the second derivative. Just a concept. The second derivative is the derivative of the first derivative. Does that make sense? So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to graph the derivative of this guy. Does that make sense? That will be the second derivative. The, when you're graphing off of another graph, a derivative, the first thing you want to do is look where the derivatives are equal to zero. Look at this graph and we want to take derivative of it. Where is the derivative is equal to zero? Where's your max min points on this graph? The derivative is equal to zero at negative one and at two, right? So the derivative is equal to zero at negative one, so I know I'm going to cross at negative one, and I'm also going to cross at two, because that's where my derivatives are, are zero at. Does that make sense? The second thing is the derivative is the slope of the tangent line visually. Does that make sense? Geometrically, the derivative is a slope of the tangent line. So over here, less than negative one, what kind of slope of a line do I have over here? What kind of slope does this graph have? Negative. Negative means it's below the x-axis, so it's negative down here. What kind of slope do I have between negative one, I'm sorry, negative one and positive two? What kind of slope is in here? Positive. positive. It means it's above the x above the x-axis to be positive up here. But remember, I got to connect my dots there. And then once I pass two, what kind of slopes do I have here? Negative. And Merry Christmas. There is my graph of my second derivative. Last thing is this, just a thought. Look at this picture right here. It's a squiggly graph, and I got two humps in it. Generally, what kind of graph looks like this? Cubic. Cubic graph has two humps in it, looks like this, squiggly, right? Now, it's because I'm going up on the left, down on the right. It's actually a negative x cube if you really want to be technical about it, but it's an x cubed graph, right? What is the derivative of an x cubed graph? 3x squared. It's an x squared graph. So I know my answer should have been a parabola. I have a parabola down here. But because this was going up on the left, down on the right, this was actually negative x cubed. And the derivative of negative x cubed is negative 3x squared. It's a negative x squared graph. That's why it's upside down. So yeah, I'm pretty happy about my answer. Does that make sense? Kind of thinking outside the box. I'm trying to understand this stuff. Take a look at number two. You know they're going to give you one of these physics problems because this is your life. All right, you're an engineering science major here, math majors and the like. Physics is your life. Let's take a look at this thing. A particle moves along the x-axis according to the law of motion. x of t is equal to 3t cubed minus 15t squared plus 24t, where t is measured in seconds and x is measured in feet. Always pay attention to units. Give your answer in units. Never forget that. This is a physics problem. In this problem, negative infinity is less than t, which is less than infinity. Find the velocity at time equals t. Well, here's three points. Let's go for it. I've got distance of x. How do I get velocity? What do I have to do? So the velocity, which is equal to the derivative, you can use Leibniz notation if you like, is what? Derivative of 3t squared is? I'm sorry. 2t cubed is 6t squared. Minus root of 15t squared is 30t. Plus root of 24t is 24. When is the particle moving to the right? Now this was x, right? Moving to the right means when we're talking about left or right, we're talking about right is where the velocity has got to be greater than zero. You think of going up or to the right as positive and down and to the left as negative. Remember your physics. If I throw the ball up, it has a positive velocity. 
Once it starts to go back down towards the earth, which is where gravity is at, it'll be negative. Does that make sense? So, on relative speaking, when we talk about physics, up and to the right, if I go left or right, right is positive, left is negative. If I go up or down, up is positive, down is negative. Does that make sense? So, to the right means the velocity has to be greater than zero. Does that make sense? So, when is this velocity going to be greater than zero? Before I find where it's greater than zero, I'm going to find where the velocity is equal to zero. So, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set it equal to zero and solve. I'm going to find where the particle stops. Understand my physics. When I set the velocity equal zero, the derivative equal zero, velocity is equal to zero, the particle stops. First, I've got to find where the particle stops at. Well, what can I factor out of this quadratic? Six, that leaves me with t squared minus five t plus four. What times what is four that add up to be negative five? It's got to be four and one. And the signs, because it's a plus, have to be the same sign, the middle terms are minus, so it's got to be minus 4, minus 1. So I set each factor equal to 0, t minus 4 equals 0, and t minus 1 equals 0. I get t equals 4, and t equals 1. But to figure out where it's positive or negative, I'm going to draw a number line. Anybody, someone asked me about when, question of time, particles moving right or left, that's going to be some kind of interval answer. So I put my numbers on here. Here's 1. Here's 4, and this is my second, my first derivative, which is the velocity equation. Pick a number in between negative infinity to 1. I have a brain, hence I will use 0. Plugging in 0 into my velocity equation, I'm going to get, pretty easy, 24. I don't care what the number is, what's the sign of it? Positive. To have a positive velocity, that means I'm moving away. I'm either going up or to the right. Does that make sense? Now pick a number between 1 and 4. I choose 2. I'm going to plug 2, and this is a calculator question here, so I'm going to use my calculator. Plug 2 into this thing. I can use the factor form or not. It's up to you. 6 times 2 squared minus 30 times 2 plus 24. I got negative 12. I don't care what the number is. It's negative. That means I am moving left or down. Does that make sense? Now pick a number bigger than 4. I choose 5. Plugging 5 into my equation. Hopefully you guys can see this. Plugging 5, I just recall it and change all of my 2's to 5's. I get 24 again. Don't care what the number is, the sign is positive. So to answer the question, which is, when is the particle moving to the right? Right is where, right and, and up is where the uh, velocity is greater than zero, which means it's what interval? Negative infinity to one, union four to infinity. That is my answer. And on the first one, I should have circled or boxed in my answer too, because that just helps out the professor to no end. And of course, I want to get on their good side. Does that make sense? Part B, when is the particle moving to the left? Well, that's just free points in my mind here. They're just throwing points at me. Appreciate it. So if I can get part B, you shameful if you don't get part C. Then. When is the particle moving to the left? Moving to the left, just to throw you some physics your way, that's when the velocity has got to be less than zero, and that's obviously going to be in the time interval between one and four. <coughs> And if you want to be fancy about it, these are time intervals, so the units would have been seconds. In the interval between one and four seconds, for negative, and being the interval between negative infinity to one second, union four seconds to infinity seconds. It's better than positive. All right. The next question is part D, is what is the total distance between zero and five? Now, we did a problem like this on test number one or two or something or other. And here's the deal. It's that total distance question. Now, you have to understand what's going on from a physics perspective to get this problem right. We're starting at zero. Now, starting at zero over here, analyze your velocity. At zero, I am already going to the right. I'm going to right until one second. At one second, I stop. 
And then I turn and go left. And I cruise left for four seconds, until four seconds, right? And at four seconds, I do what? Stop again, and then I turn around and start moving to the right, and I continue moving right, and I'm moving right to this day. Does that make sense? There it is. Now to figure out the distance, total distance between zero and five, and that's the word, total distance, I have to break it up over where I stopped at. I gotta, so I'm gonna be zero to five. So I'm gonna talk about distance, so that'll be S, the original function, or X actually, X, the original function, but I wanna figure out the distance between one and zero, and I'm gonna use absolute values. Understand what's going on here. That's the word, total distance between zero and five, okay? So x between one and zero. Why? I'm starting at zero because they told me to, I, and I stop at one for just a second, and I cut it off because that is going to be the air where I'm moving to the right. Then I'm going to add it to, I'm going to start back at one again and go all the way up to four. So it'll be x of four minus x of one. This will be the distance between one and zero when I'm moving to the right. This is the distance between four and one, one to four seconds, which is when I'm moving left, and I'm gonna take absolute value of it. I do expect this value to be negative because I'm moving left. Then I'm gonna add that to the rest of the time. And I'm supposed to end at five, so this would be x of five minus x of four when I'm moving back to the right again. Does that make sense? You understand what I'm doing. I have to break up my total time based upon the points at where I stopped at. Because when I stop, I'm changing direction. When I stopped at one, I went from going to the right to going to the left. And between one and four, I'm going to the left, and then I want to stop that time, cut it off, and then pick it up when I'm going back to the right again. So this one, I'm going right, I'm going left, I'm going right. And if there's more points that I change, I have to keep breaking them up. Now, to figure out this, I'm going to show you guys a real trick on how to use your calculator. I'm going to remember, I had to figure out these points by the derivative, but to figure out the distance, I go back to the original problem. So in this pro on my calculator, just to save time, I'm going to type in this function, 2x, oops, wrong button there, y equals 2, instead of t, I use x cubed minus 15x squared plus 24x. And I'm just going to go zoom 6 and just graph it, because I don't care, I just want the graph, because what I want to do is evaluate these, this thing. So here's my graph, I'm moving to the right, then I'm moving to the left, then I'm moving to the right, that's what's going on. So, the value at 1. So, second calculate value. I want to plug into my calculator the value when x is 1. And what value do I get? 11. So, this would be absolute value of 11 <coughs> minus. When I plug in second calculate value at 0, I get 0. Plus the absolute value, I want x of 4. Second, calculate the value at 4. That'll be negative 16 minus when I plug in 1. When I plug in 1, I got 11, absolute value. Plus, when I plug in 5 into my function, I got negative 5 minus when I plug in 4 into my function, I got negative 16. Watch your signs. So all I did was plug these numbers into my calculator just made it a lot easier to do. So now, let's do the math. 11 minus 0 is 11. Plus, negative 16 minus 11, that's negative, what, 27. Absolute value. Plus, a minus a minus makes it a plus, that'll be 16 minus 5, which is 11. Yeah, 16 minus 5 is 11. Absolute value. Okay? So absolute value. So this is equal to 11. Absolute value of 11 is 11. Absolute value of negative 27 is positive 27. Absolute value of 11 is 11. So it's uh, 11 plus 27 plus 11, which is a grand total of 49. Don't forget your units. These are physics problems. 49 what? This thing's distance is measured in feet. We expect to see feet. You actually lost them, one or two points if you didn't put your units on it. Does that make sense? Questions?
and you've got them on the Excel spreadsheet. Okay, thanks. And, and you Excel spreadsheet it? Okay, excellent. Thank you. All right, so I got 49 feet. Does that make sense? Now, what about the next one here? When is the acceleration positive? What's acceleration? Physics problem again. Second derivative. So I got to come down here and go for the second derivative. Luckily, which is acceleration, which is the derivative of the first derivative. Well, luckily, I got the first derivative right up here. Here was my first derivative. 6t squared minus 30t plus 24. The derivative of 6t squared is 12t. Derivative of minus 30t is minus 30. Derivative of 24 is 0. <coughs> so, here's my acceleration. They want to know when the acceleration is positive. So, I want to take my acceleration and set it greater than 0. Now, there's a couple of different ways I can do this one. Positive acceleration, I just take acceleration and set it greater than 0. This is not a quadratic, so you can just go ahead and straight solve this thing if you want to, which is easy. I would add 30 to both sides, so I get 12t would be greater than 30. And then I would divide by 12, and I get 30 to be, I mean, t to be greater than 30 over 12. Of course, we're, we're math majors here and science majors and the like, so 30 divided by 12, we want to know what numbers are, which is 2.5 seconds. T's got to be greater than 2.5 seconds. I could have done it the same way that I did with the first root of trying to figure out whether it was positive. I could also do the number line part, which would have been the second derivative, which is acceleration. I would have first set it equal to zero to figure out the inflection point, which t would have been 2.5. And then I could have drawn a number line on this thing, putting 2.5 on there and picking a number within each interval. The second derivative acceleration at zero would have been negative 30. It's negative accelerating there or negative or to the, uh, or um, going to the left. And here, the positive accelerate, I would have checked it with a number bigger than 2.5, which would have been 3. Plugging in 3 into this thing, 12 times 3, which is 36, minus 30, which is 6, which is positive. We would also accept the answer 2.5 to infinity. And again, that would have been in seconds. Does that make sense? Yeah. What's the definition of speeding up is a question. To speed up. All right. You, to speed up, there's two ways you can speed up. To speed up, you can, you got to go, you got to be going, your velocity and your acceleration have to be going in the same direction. All right. Think about your car. The question is about the definition of speeding up. If you get in your car, when do I speed up? My velocity is going home and my, I'm accelerating towards home. So my velocity direction and my acceleration have to be in the same direction. So if I consider home away from UNC Charlotte, UNC Charlotte is the ground source, so away is positive, towards is going to be negative. Okay. So if I'm in Concord driving towards UNC Charlotte, that's negative. But if I'm accelerating towards Charlotte and, 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 and my velocity is towards Charlotte, again, I am speeding up towards Charlotte. So to answer your question, the answer to quote unquote speed up from a physics perspective is when the velocity and the acceleration are in the same direction. So they either both have to be positive or both have to be negative at the same time. So you kind of compare both number lines. All right. You remember this one? It's a web work problem. Yeah, question. Always put your units. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I don't think we took off points if you just gave us the interval understood, but always give us units just to double check what you know. So we, so. It uh, depends on who's grading the exam. So, again, when it comes to free response stuff, give them more information is better than less information. All right. This is uh, the uh, person walking away from the light pole problem. We did this one on web work. I'm throwing it at you guys again. 
And they try to help you out with the same way WebWork did, but let's see if we can do this one. A spotlight is located on the side of a building 30 feet above the ground. A six foot tall man, that is different from WebWork when it was the six foot tall woman, is jogging away at a speed of 12 feet per second, directed towards the, the pole, directly toward uh, the point beneath the spotlight. All right. We want to determine how fast the length of the shadow is changing when he is 20 feet from the pole. Please refer to diagram and the instructions below. All right. So, what's going on here? X, let X represent the distance from the man to the wall where there's some kind of a light source right here, okay? Okay. And let Y be the length of his shadow. So, here's his shadow down here. See there we go. Now, this one, we try to help you guys out, but by, and sometimes, the more help we give, the more confused students get, and then they end up losing more points. So, when in doubt, and if the instructions aren't helping you out, and you know what you think you should do, set to the side of the page and do everything you should do, and then we will try to figure out if you're in the right path. Because I'm telling you, sometimes you can read this problem, and people get confused on our help. We try to make it so simple that it was kind of sad. All right, so here we go. Take a look at this one. All right. Here's the question. A six foot tall man is jogging at a speed of 12 feet per second directly toward the point beneath the spotlight. He's going this way. Does that make sense? Here's the guy. In case you can't tell. Here he is. <laughs> okay. And he's jogging towards the light. So. This is the distance that he's jogging. So what is dx dt going to be equal to? Well, how fast is he going? 12 what? Notice your tension. The, your units. This is a related rate problem. He is going what? 12 feet per second. But he is going towards the source. Like when we're talking about gravity. Pulling you down. When we throw things off the building and the thing starts to drop. The, the object goes towards the ground. We call that what kind of velocity? Negative velocity when it goes towards the source. When you go away, it's considered positive velocity. Does that make sense? So, he's going towards the source. So, what kind of unit, what kind of sign should this guy have? It should be negative. And they're trying, when we went out of our way, is it positive or negative, dude? Okay. I don't know. And people messed it up. Okay. Does that make sense? The dx dt is going to be negative 12 feet per second. It's just basically, here's three points. Can you read the problem and figure out what that 12 is supposed to be? It represents based on the picture. It's got to be, uh, it's the rate of change of x, so it's dx dt. It's 12, and because it's going to source, it's negative. It's a physics question. Next one, part b. Write an equation that relates the variables x and y to the given diagram. Well, we know this. The dude is six feet tall. And I, what I see here is I see a little bitty triangle right here where this is six and this is y. Does that make sense? And I see the big picture, which is right here, which is this is 30. And what is his total distance down here? X plus y. So in terms of your relationship, what you should see is the fact that these are similar triangles and the ratio of sides of similar triangles are equal. Welcome geometry, high school, 10th grade stuff. Okay, which is this. Y is to six, Y over six as equals X plus Y is to 30. This is what we wanted. Write an equation that relates the variables together and it's from the similar triangle. Okay? Use the results in part A and part B to determine dy dx when the man is 20 feet from the building and from the distance from the building this is x equals 20. Okay? Well, there's lots of ways to do this one. I'm going to jump in both feet and start taking derivatives, but you know, a lot of my students cannot seem to handle fractions. So I'm going to try to help you out here because there's so many different ways you can do this problem. You can jump in with both feet and just start taking greater respect to t. It's a related rate problem. But to help out some students, I am going to multiply by the common denominator just to get rid of my fractions so people don't screw this up. 
So what is your common denominator here between 6 and 30? What's the common denominator between 6 and 30? What is the biggest number that both of them divide into? Yeah, thank you. It's 30. 30. So multiply both sides by 30. 6 goes into 30 five times. 5y is equal to 30's cancel x plus y. Now, take this is a little easier equation to take the derivative of. You could have done it the other way. No one cares. Take the derivative with respect to t. It's related rate. So every time I take a derivative of a variable, I tack on d variable dt. So this would be 5 dy dt equals derivative of x is dx dt plus derivative of y is dy dt. Does that make sense? What are you trying to solve for in this problem? Find what? dy dt, which is the rate of change of the shadow here. So I'm going to combine like terms. I'm going to subtract dy dt from both sides. This is 1 dy dt. What is 5 dy dt minus 1 dy dt? 4 dy dt equals dx dt. But what was dx dt equal to? You had to get that part right so you know what to plug in. It's negative 12. So 4 dy dt is equal to negative 12. And then I'm going to divide by 4 on both sides. And that is going to give me dy dt equals negative 12 divided by 4 is negative 3. And don't forget your units. The units were half the points on this thing. What were the units on this guy? How This is a rate of change of the shadow. What kind of rates are we looking at in this particular problem for sh shadows and distances and stuff? Feet per what? Second. Second. So the answer is negative 3 feet per second. And it should be negative because if you think about it, as the guy is walking here, his shadow is going to be shrinking up. It's going to be negative. Does that make sense? And if you think about it, this was equivalent to the six foot tall light pole woman problem that we did. Except the only difference here is the woman was walking away. This one, the guy's walking towards the light pole. All right, here's another one. And I tried to give you guys problems on my test that uh, kind of related this. But here's the deal. You're supposed to read the calculus information and figure out what's going on. It's detective work. All right, so I got two more problems to do here. A function f satisfies the conditions below. The domain of f is all the x uh, except when x equals 0 and x equals 2. x equals 0 and x equals 2 are vertical isomptotes. The limit as x approaches infinity of f of x is 2. The limit as x approaches infinity, negative infinity of f of x is negative 1. They also tell me f of negative 1 is negative 2, f of 1 is negative 1, f of 3 is 0, f prime of 0, f prime of x is greater than 0 on the interval to infinity, f prime of x is less than 0 on the interval between negative infinity to 0 and union 0 to 2, f double prime is greater than 0 on the interval between 1 and 0 and 1, and f double prime is less than zero on the interval between negative infinity to zero, union one to two, union two to infinity. List any horizontal isomptotes. List the x coordinates of any points of inflection. And then the last goal is to sketch the graph and there's the big picture. And the big points was this one. All right, first thing you need to do is think about the relationship of the derivatives and stuff here. All right, first <coughs> off, we've got this guy right here f prime is greater than zero. f prime being greater than zero means I am increasing. I read a graph from left to right. f prime is less than zero means I am decreasing. I read a graph from left to right. f double prime is greater than zero means I am concave up. f double prime less than zero means I'm concave down. Okay. So, as I'm looking at this particular problem, all right, x equals 0, x equals 1 are vertical isomptotes. So I know my VAs are x equals 0, x equals 2. Remember what the limit as what x approaches infinity. When your limit as x approaches infinity gives you what? As you approach infinity, as x gets bigger and positive and bigger negatively, they give you the horizontal isomptotes. So the horizontal isomptotes would be y equals 2 and y equals negative 1. So the first question is this, list any horizontal isomptotes. 
Horizontal isomptotes, by definition, is the limit as x approaches infinity or the limit as x approaches negative infinity of your function. That is the definition of a horizontal isomptote. So, the horizontal isomptotes are the equations y equals 2 and y equals negative 1. And while I'm at it, I'm going to go ahead and graph this thing down here while I understand all the information here. I can tell you right now, at x equals 0 and x equals 2, I got vertical isomptotes. I don't cross vertical isomptotes, so I got to either blow up or blow down. Okay? I know also at y equals 2, 1, 2, here's y equals 2, I have a horizontal isomptote. And also at y equals negative 1, so I declare this to be negative 1. This is also a horizontal isomptote. Just kind of gritting up my problem here. This one, they're giving me points. F of negative 1 is negative 2. F of negative 1 is negative 2. So plot a point. F of 1 is negative 1. F of positive 1 is negative 1. So I'm going to that point right there. Remember, you can always cross horizontal isomptotes. You can never cross a vertical isomptote. Also given f of 3 equals 0. So here's 3. Equal to 0 means it's crossing the x-axis. So i got these three points I'm going to have to go through. Now, let's put all my information together. I know that I am increasing positive derivative on the interval between 0 and 1. I'm assuming on the interval between 2 and infinity. So 2 to infinity, I know I've got to increase. Right? So I'm just kind of lightly remind myself I'm going up there. And on the interval between negative infinity to 0 and on the interval between 0 and 2, I'm going to have to decrease in these intervals. Okay? I'm going to go down. This second derivative deals with concavity. I am going to be concave up on the interval between 0 and 1. Between 0 and 1, I'm going to be concave up. On the interval between uh, negative infinity to 0 and 1 to 2, and 2 to infinity, I'm going to be concave down. So 2 to infinity, I'm concave down. From negative infinity to 0, I'm going to be concave down. And between 1 and 2, I'm going to be concave down. The question is, is this. List any x uh, coordinates of an inflection point. An inflection point is where you change concavity. Where am I changing concavity at? Remember. 2 and 0 are vertical isomptotes. I've got to skip over those guys. Any other vertical, any other points of possible uh, points of inflection? It's got to be at 1. x equals 1 is going to be an inflection point because below it I'm supposed to be concave up and just above it I've got to be concave down. Below between 0 and 1 I'm concave up. Between 1 and 2 I'm concave down. That makes 1 an inflection point. x equals 1 is an inflection point. Now, let's put all this stuff together. All right. Again, trying to draw everything here together so you guys can see it. But understand, you start from negative infinity to go infinity. I know I have a horizontal isomptote at y equals negative 1 when I'm going to negative infinity here. And I know my autofocus is working here. But when y equals negative infinity, I'm negative 1. So I'm going to start coming in over here, but notice what's going to do. I'm going to come in right in here on this horizontal isomptote, but I have got to decrease because at negative infinity I'm going to be going down, and at negative infinity I've got to be concave down. How do I go down and become concave down? Put it together. I've got to go down and be concave down, and I've got to go through this point right here. So to go down and to be concave down, going down and concave down, I've got to do this. <coughs> But remember, I can't cross that line x equals 0, so it's going to do this. There's where that picture is going to be at. Now, once I pass 0, between 0 and 1, I've got to be concave up, but i still got to be decreasing. Decreasing and concave up. How do I got to be decreasing and concave up? So decreasing and concave up is going to have to do this. Now to decrease, i got to go down. If only I'm going to go down. Remember, I can't cross a vertical isomptote, so i got to start at the top. i got to go down, 
and go and be concave up. So I'm going to be U-shaped up, but I got to go through this point here. Remember, X equals 1 is an inflection point. Inflection point will change concavity. After 1, I'm going to be concave down and still decrease. So now I'm going to be concave down and decrease. So I get that picture in there. Now once I pass 2, pass 2, I got to be concave down past 2, and past 2, I got to be increasing. I got to be increasing and concave down. How do I increase and be concave down? And also remember, I have y equals 2 is as x approaches and positive infinity, I'm going to 2. So I know I got to eventually come out this line right here. And I got to go through this point here. I got to increase and be concave down the whole time. So this is my picture. And this is all the information put together. It's a game. Does that make sense? Uh, putting increasing with concave up, with increasing concave down, with decreasing concave up, decreasing concave down, and putting the vertical and horizontal isotopes on it. Question. Well, you know this kind of problem is going to be on the final exam in terms of free response. And that is some kind of weird optimization problem. We have done tons of them. Boxes, cylinders, Norman windows, uh, so forth and so on. Wires we want to turn into boxes and circles. Yada, yada, yada. All right. Last problem here. Here we go. Dr. Einstein wishes to enclose a rectangular uh, totally area totaling 43,200 square feet. When you, run, when you read a problem and you run across a number, write him down and write down the units. 43,200 feet squared. And feet squared means this is area. This is my constraint they're writing down. Along a straight portion of river, he wishes to subdivide the area with a fence uh, perimeter to the river. See a picture, a diagram below. No fencing is required along the river. What are the dimensions that minimize the total amount of fencing to be used? What do we want to do? Minimize fencing. All right. So we want to write that down. We want to minimize fencing. All right. For part one, part A here, it says this. Write an equation for the desired total area in terms of the variables x and y in the diagram. We are drawing a rectangle. What is the area of a rectangle? You've got to know your forms. What is it? Based on these letters here. X is along this way and Y is uh, the distance this way. So what is the area of this picture? Uh, it's a rectangle. So it's length times width. So is X times Y. But what did they tell me area was? 43,200 feet squared. That's got to be x times y, and this was the answer that they were looking for. You understand what we're trying to do. On these kind of problems where there are massive point totals, we are trying to help you do the problem by giving you part A, part B, part C. So we're giving you points for every step you accomplish. So it's one big question. They want you to minimize fencing. So you can go over here to the side and just do the whole problem, and then go back and answer the questions if you want to. And that's fine, and sometimes that is the best way of going about doing it. But I'm trying to show you what they're looking for in each part here. Now, part B, write an expression of variables x and y and the total length of fencing required. Remember, this is the objective equation, minimize fencing. Where are you putting fencing at? And pay attention. I saw a lot of students screw this problem up on my last test because they didn't figure out how much fencing I put on this thing. So, where are you putting fencing at? We're putting fencing here, here, and here. How many is that? Three Y. On my test, it was like four of them, so be careful. It was three of them. One, two, three. Three Y's plus how many X's? One, because there's the river down there, and we're not going to put fence near the river. So there's the equation they want here. This is my objective equation. This is the guy I want to take rid of, of, set him equal to zero, and solve. Okay? Now, the next one says this. Use the equation in part A to express the length of the fence directly as a function of x. Here's my problem. It's the same old problem. This is the guy I want to take rid of. I've set him equal to zero and solve. Problem is, too many letters. I want to solve, get this thing in terms of x. So I know that x times y equals 43,200. So what is y equal to? 
Well, that would be 43,200 divided by x. I'm going to plug that into this equation and give me fence equals two, 3 times y, which is 43,200 divided by x plus x. And you always want to clean this up. So fencing would be equal to, and now it's time for calculator, 43,200 times 3. That is equal to 129,600 divided by x plus x. And that is the answer that we're looking for. This is the guy you want to take derivative of, set him equal to zero and solve, because it says minimize fencing. Now I have my fencing in terms of one variable. Now we'll notice part D. How do you maximize or minimize anything? What are you going to do? Take derivative, set him equal to zero and solve. Now use calculus to find the critical numbers. How do you find a critical number? You take derivative, set equal zero and solve. But first, you should clean them up. So fencing would be equal to 129,600 x to the negative 1, because I don't like stuff on the bottom, plus x. Now f prime, the derivative is going to be negative 129,600 x to the negative 2, plus what is derivative of x? 1. Set him equal to 0 and solve. Negative 129,600 over x squared is going to be equal to negative 1. I subtracted 1 from both sides. I'm going to multiply by x squared, so I get negative 129,600 equals negative x squared, multiplying by x squared on both sides. I'm going to divide by negative 1. That gives me x squared is equal to 129,600. And what do I got to do to solve for x? Take the square root of both sides, and you might as well clean them up. So x is equal to the square root of 129,600, which is equal to, it's always nice when you got a good, nice number, 360. But, wait a minute here. <clears throat> Don't forget your units. What are your units? What is it X being measured in? X is the length of the fence, which is measured in what? Feet. So that would be 360 feet. That is the answer for part D. Now, the last one. What is the value of Y that corresponds to the X in part D? So basically they're asking you what's the dimensions. Now, they went out of their way, and again, again, it screwed up a lot of people because we're trying to give you a step for every step you're supposed to do with this kind of a problem, and that messes people up. And if it messes you up, then go to the side of the paper and do the entire problem, find the dimensions that minimizes the area or the, uh, the amount of fencing, and then go put the answers in the respective blanks, and you'll still get 100% credit. So y, y was equal to 43,200 divided by x. So y is going to be 43,200 divided by 360, which is 43,200 divided by 360 is 120. So I give my answer y equals 120. Does that make sense? Now, I have finished the exam, and I still got... 10 minutes to go with way deep explanation on this stuff, and I even got started late. But I told you it would go towards 1 o'clock. I kind of knew this. But this all being said, don't let this be the only exam you use. Also, they're going to give you other problems than this. Now, I have a question for you guys. How hard was this exam? How hard was this exam? What do you think the class university average on this exam was? What should you have made on this exam? A hundred, because it wasn't real hard. It was shameful if you couldn't do this whole thing. Class average is about a 68 on this exam. That's embarrassing. But I want to remind you of this. Most important, calculus is a competition. It is you versus the rest of the world. So the rest of the world made an average of a 68. You make sure you're not one of those guys. You make sure you should be in the 90s. We did have a lot of 100s on this thing, but we had a lot of people who did not like the way they did part A, part B on these word problems, and it killed them. So if you run across one of these word problems or whatever, that you're working on this stuff, and that you, I know how to do this problem, but I don't understand the questions that they're trying to get me to do it in a particular step, 
then go to the side, do the problem your way, and go back and answer the questions to the best of your ability. We will give you huge points for that. Give us the answer. If you don't like our directions, then do it yourself. But what we're trying to do is give you guys directions as we go through this stuff and, and uh, you know, try to help you out because you know, this is a 10-point problem. This is, these are make-or-break kind of problems for you guys on this. So it's three points for part A, two points for part B. We're breaking it up so we make it consistent so we got uniform grades on this stuff. That is why we do this. Do not let this all be the only exam. This one was quote unquote easy. Then if you think this one is easy, look at the semester before that. It's on my Moodle site for my students. And look at the semester before that. That's also on the Moodle site for our students. Make sure you go back and look at several semesters because they're not going to do exactly these questions. They're going to change them up. They're going to give you that Norman window problem. Or they're going to give you a problem on wire where you have to rotate around. So look at other problems to make sure you know how to do these problems. All right? So, and then, uh, so I will, I'm going to cut this thing off and then we'll talk about your test number four here for a second. So, um, let me do this.